all presenting. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the June 8th regular meeting of the Hopkinton School Committee. I will ask that you stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, welcome. We have a busy agenda tonight, and we are currently working to connect uh, remotely with Mina in India. So as soon as she is on the Google Hangout, we'll put her here with us. And just as a reminder to everybody, because of the remote participation policy, all of our votes will be roll call votes because she's not physically present. Um, so I'm going to quickly read through the agenda, and then we will get started. We'll start with recognitions, then we'll have our first opportunity for public comment. We have several reports to the school committee. Uh, I'm going to read them in order, but we'll be taking some out of order. First is the student council report, then followed by the F1 visa program update. We'll have three reports by, by Mr. Westerling, traffic calming construction, water tank replacement plans, and hazardous waste collection day update. Um, we'll have an update. I will have an update. Dr. McLeod will have an update. We will have um, a, re a report from Dr. Zoltleski regarding a CPAC task list. Um, the assistant superintendent will give us a report and we'll have a, a report about AP bio biology recommendations followed by liaison reports. Under new business, we'll be considering an overnight ta uh, travel field trip request, reward of contracts for the laptops and other Apple products. We'll be considering several budget transfers, um, we'll discuss our request to extend end of year balances. We have a capital project warrant article to vote on. We need to vote on the Lou and Kathy White Memorial Scholarship. We'll have a presentation of the senior class gift. We actually will do that under the student council liaison report so that our senior who has graduated and nicely come back doesn't have to sit here until 10 o'clock tonight. Um, all of that will be followed by our second opportunity for public comment. Um, and then items by consensus. And so there you have it. So without further ado, Dr. McLeod, if you want to start with recognitions. I do want to start with recognitions. Um, Aaron and Tara, could you come up? Oh, thank you. So Aaron Graziano and Tara Sonda are here tonight um, on behalf of the HPTA. Um, Sorry, now Mina can uh, see you. Oh, hi Mina. Um, thank you for being here tonight. I, I know that we typically have a time when we come and recognize you for all of your work, um, particularly around fundraising. Um, but I wanted to do a separate recognition tonight because of, I, I think you're both, I know you're still gonna be doing some extracurricular work, right, um, Tara? But um, Aaron, I know that you're stepping down and um, I know I've worked with both of you over the past couple of years. Aaron, ever since I got here, um, you've taken me by the hand and uh, always have been so gracious with it, just hel helping us to have that kind of communication with parents um, through the schools. I think the things that you do that go, the work that happens, the tireless work that goes without recognition, um, and the things that you do for the schools and for the teachers and for the children um, I, all of the principals know, uh, and, and I just think that I really wanted to give an opportunity for the school committee to recognize um, all of the tremendous work that you have done over the many years. Um, and I know that that won't end, uh, but it also just feels like those, the volunteers that do the most, I think sometimes just go unrecognized, and I didn't want that to happen. So I do have a little, a little thank you for you. Um, I'm just going to sneak over here while the school committee, if they want to jump in there. Do you, do you want to start down the end? Sure, sure, I'll start. Mm -hmm. So I know, as you know, the new kid on the, the table here, but you, your name has been on so many emails <laughs> for, you know, the four years that my children have been in the public schools, and it's so, you're, what you've contributed is unbelievable, so thank you. It's both of you guys, we thank you so much for everything that you've done. I just like when Kathy invites you to meetings because I get we get to see each other. <laughs> <laughs> this is, yeah, this is our date night. <laughs> no, thank you both for, for everything that, that you've done over the last
last two years and will continue to do. And there are probably some of us who are slightly looking forward to the president role ending, but yeah. uh, it's because of all the time and energy that you've put into it. So. John Durbin is a prophet. He takes the uh, lead at home when I need to step in as the CPA secretary. Neither is it any idea where our kids are right now. <laughs> 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 You both have done a tremendous job. You've brought a lot of uh, really good energy uh, into the PTA, which was already a, a good, strong organization. But you've brought some new ideas and some fresh energy. And thank you. I agree. And ha having walked in your shoes, I really, ha I know um, how much that none of us are even thinking about and recognizing that goes into what you do all day, every day, every little thing. You. PTA is always the backup for everything. You never say no. You come through for all the schools, for us. You give a tremendous amount of money, but even more than that, you give so much time. And um, it, it's really tremendous. And you're really going out with a bang, too, with this <laughs> carnival. Um, so I really hope that you have some downtime planned for next week. Put your feet up. Maybe some people would like to give you a <laughs> Guest certificate to a massage or make you dinner or something. But oh. thank you both. <laughs> this so is their much. date night. They just said that. That that was it. But thank you both so much. It's really tremendous, and it's uh, the impact that you have in the schools is incredible. And I, again, I just wanted to say, look, oh, I'm sorry, so sorry, over in India, Nina. Go ahead. Um, I just want to say that the past two years I've been volunteering since the time my son joined center school. And I have seen Erin at almost every program that I volunteer. And I wonder how many other programs are out there that she goes to. She said at one of the volunteer appreciation programs, which I really admired, she said, um, you know, she talked a little bit about her family background and her values. And she talked about the fact that she believes in acting, not complaining. She says that a lot of people complain, but. Um, want to make a change something um, I, I really appreciate that and I think she lives those values so great job Erin you and your entire team of volunteers thank you for all that you do thank you thank you me, the only thing I was going to add was just on behalf of the teachers because I know how much they appreciate all that you do and you always make them feel so special with all of the things that I know you know just I know you've been a former teacher and you know what that means to teachers, but um, all of those efforts are so appreciated um, by the teachers. I know there are, there are some here tonight and um, just wanted to make sure that I added that thank you as well. So um, thank you for coming tonight and, and please know that everything that you have done and are doing is just so very appreciated. opportunity for public comment. Is there anybody here from the public that would like to speak? Okay. Seeing none, I will just update the committee. We did receive one email this week, uh, this week I think, from um, one of our local legislators just inquiring about the question of later start times for the high school. So I did respond to her with an update regarding the work that Mr. Bishop um, led last summer uh, to study this question and what the results were but other than that we have received no emails or at least I have received no emails this week either um, so why don't we call up Mercedes LaHaye and she can present the senior class gift to us you are the senior class vice president, vice president. welcome Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mercedes Manuela Hay, and I am the Vice President for the Class of 2017. And tonight I will be presenting the class gift to you all. Um, to honor the memory of law, uh, students lost by some of our HHS classmates, we will be donating money to the Thomas Weaver Be Positive Memorial Scholarship, the Keep Smiling for Abby, Memorial Scholarship and the Shane DeRoche Memorial Scholarship Fund. Also, the cafeteria has been a gathering place for so many students before the first bell in the morning, during lunches, studies, 
that and even after school before practice or a club meeting. So last year, the graduating class created a beautiful garden outside of the cafeteria in honor for Abby Benford. So the second part of our class gift will be three circular picnic tables outside of the cafeteria. So that will encourage more students to go outside and enjoy the garden. Um, we will also be installing a personalized class of 2017 bench outside of the atrium, uh, which is where you enter the high school, and that will be to replace the benches that were damaged last year during the winter. That's great. Great. You guys had a lot of money. That's <laughs> <laughs> crazy. Thank you so much. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Oh, I just think it's fantastic. Those are great things to do. Okay, I think, yeah. I think we have to officially or accept mm -hmm. or approve. What's the right verb? I think you have to accept it. Okay, so then I just am looking for a motion to accept the gifts from the class of 2017. So moved. And a second. Second, so go ahead. <laughs> we'll give that to Nancy. Seconds and thirds. And That's we'll, awesome. Because we'll do a roll call. So Nina. I approve with gratitude. <laughs> Thank you. And Jen? Absolutely, yes, I approve. John? Yes. And Nancy? Yes. And I'm a yes. So that is unanimous, and we're very grateful to you. Thank you very much. These are well, tremendous gifts. Thank you so much. Great job. You. Thank Congratulations. You so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Can we get microphones towards you a little bit? Toward, towards me? Yeah. I was trying to make it so you could hear Nina. I know, but you're speaking more. Okay. All right. <laughs> Um, <coughs> so next is our, why don't we hold off on our F1 visa program update and we'll move right to Mr. Westerling. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so please come up and join us and I see that you have some guests with you. I do. Or I can't ahead. believe that after six years I finally have the opportunity to meet this group. Yeah. This is wonderful. <laughs> Thank you for, uh, I didn't know we were that in demand. <laughs> <laughs> you got three items there, yeah. Mr. Wet, you're overachiever here. And thank you for taking uh, taking me out of order. Do you have a specific order, those three items that you want to we address? Have, our order was traffic cleaning, <coughs> water tank replacement, and hazardous waste, but honestly, as long as however you would like to do it is fine. So let me start by saying thank you to the superintendent and to the school committee for allowing us to use the property of the high school for our hazardous waste collection. It will occur on July 15th, which is a Saturday. It will be from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. And this is the opportunity for Hopkinton residents to bring in household hazardous waste. So old uh, oil-based paints that they haven't been using, they've got any old gasoline or anything like that that they want to dispose of. We typically hold it at our Wood Street site, but because of the construction, we don't have a spot. So we're grateful for the opportunity. Um, do you have any specific questions on that day? Anyone? Questions? So you, said, so you said it was July 15th? Yes. Okay. That was... Nina, any questions? Any questions about the hazardous waste collection day? No, thank no. you. Okay. Okay. All right. Then I'll move on to the next item, which is the Hayden Road traffic calming. And I'll ask Bill Mertz from World Tech Engineering to come up. Uh, as the school committee knows, town meeting approved and the warrant later approved the funding for traffic calming elements along Hayden Road. Uh, just this past Tuesday, the Board of Selectmen also authorized a $100,000 transfer of funds from existing funds into an account with which we can do some of those low-hanging fruit items for traffic calming. The uh, flashing pedestrian beacon at EMC Park, the, uh, the flashing your, your speed is radar signs. So we'll be able to incorporate some of those elements, the, the low-hanging fruit, the easier elements. But the thing that we want to specifically address with you tonight and get any feedback and answer any questions is the work that we're proposing out in front of the school campus. Uh, as you may recall, and we've got the plan here if you want to see it, we are proposing to calm the traffic and move it through that area effectively and efficiently by putting in some curbing, by uh, taking out the existing pavement and putting down new pavement with new striping that will allow for left-hand turn lanes for northbound traffic into both Hopkins School and the high school, We'll also be widening the driveway from Hopkins School 
so that folks that are exiting the property can turn both in the left-hand turn lane and the right-hand turn lane. So we are looking to conduct that work through our existing general materials bids contracts. So we won't have to go out to bid for this work, which will help to expedite the actual construction. Um, and if you want, we can we can touch briefly on what our expected time frame is for that work and when we think that that can occur. So I'll turn it over to Bill Marks from World Tech Engineering. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, so the, the goal over the next, I'll say, couple months is to really turn that plan that uh, you've all have seen. As John said, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll be glad to answer them. Uh, take that from a concept level plan to a design plan where it, it can be issued to the contractor who can price out the work and then actually go to construction. So over the next couple months, it's probably gonna be a couple weeks or so to have the actual topographic survey done out there. That the, the concept plan that you've seen to date was done over an aerial. So now we really need to put the map to it and, and nail it down. So over the next couple weeks, we can get the survey out there. Uh, and then we're probably gonna need a month or so for design, uh, to get the design plans done. We'll probably do one round, have a review with the, uh, with the town and then go the contractor to actually price it and to, to lay out the work. So as far as schedule, we're probably looking at sometime in August for the construction, um, most likely the middle to the end of August, which I know is kind of coinc coinciding with the beginning of, of school. Uh, so we'll have to work with the contractor as far as time frames, when he can start, when he needs to stop, uh, where his, his lay down the staging areas is gonna be, where is he gonna be putting materials, so we're gonna be working with the contractor as far as that, and that will also uh, play into his schedule, his time frame, and his, and his scheduling of the work where he needs to know he needs to be off the road at certain times. Um, so the major activities, it's not, a, it's not, this isn't a year long construction. This is probably in the order of a month time frame. Uh, and some activities are more intensive than others. The biggest work, as John mentioned, is gonna be resetting the curving. Once the curbing is all done, they're, they're milling the road, which is basically scraping off an inch and a half to two inches and putting pavement back. That's probably a week or so time frame. Uh, we're probably looking at six, 700 feet of, of that construction. So the, the, this isn't a month and month and month job. It's probably a month time frame. Uh, so I, I'm really interested in hearing what your concerns are as far as the time frame, which is gonna help me convey the message to the contractor and really lay out the work so I can give you a more definitive schedule on the duration of the actual construction. Does that make sense? Does anybody want to start, want to start down that way? Um, I guess from the standpoint of the time frame, if it's going to start mid-August and school starts, you know, say two weeks after construction begins, um, you're going to have a bunch of new parents not sure of the traffic pattern for both Hopkins, for the middle school, for the high school. That already, I suspect, I mean, I haven't had to experience it yet, but I know it, where I work, it, it, it complicates the traffic flow on the first couple of weeks of school. And so I don't know if there's a, I would suspect that if there was a way to avoid that first couple of weeks of school, that would probably be the best. I mean, you know, I am sure we could defer to somebody who's more experienced with this, but it would seem to me like that would be a tricky spot. It's great feedback and we yeah. can absolutely delay the beginning of the work until those traffic patterns and parents understand yeah. where they should be going. I, I guess, so uh, I might look over at the right side of the yeah. table here from yeah. an operational perspective right. of, of what the thoughts are from, I, I know it's not gonna be your problem, Ralph, but you obviously <laughs> have a lot of experience with with, <laughs> with, the, with transportation and, and Dr. McLeod and Dr. Cavanaugh, just you know, in terms of right. operations at the beginning of school, I think it that? might be a good to get your opinion before. I'm going to be really smart here. I'm going to turn to Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> it's taken all this time. <laughs> Finally. Um, so we had a meeting this afternoon, okay. and, and one of the, that great one question. Of the, okay. um, one of the things that we discussed was that this is a perfect uh, opportunity tonight to bring up the question that came up multiple times at town meeting, which is around, you know, the traffic pattern, the mitigation, the plans for going forward in. You know, we did say, and, and, and I know Mr. Westerling, you, you handled those questions so well, um, we were talking about this project. But part of the conversation had always been, you know, with once the, once the project is approved, that we know from an operational pr point of view, we really need to look at this and look at traffic patterns within both the high school and middle school parking lots. 
and if there are going to be any changes, well, there will be changes, and the resulting changes to put to have in place by the beginning of school, no matter when they finish their work. Because as we discussed this afternoon, to try to change traffic patterns or parent parent habits right. um, once they're in place for the beginning of the year. So I will be pulling together our team, John, um, police, fire, um, Phil, administration, um, Mr. Dumas, we'll put him on speaker or something, um, to, to really look closely at something that has been a growing problem in both of our parking lots as well, mm -hmm. um, and then look at a replacement to the cars lining up that I know that it was expressed multiple times at town meeting mm -hmm. in front of the tennis court so that that will be mitigated and there will be alternative plans um, in place regardless of when they finish their project. It, it, and so there's that piece. That will include the entry to Hopkins and all of what's going to happen. And I know that we've already worked with you and probably will want to work with you some more on you know looking at what that might mean. Um, and there, it could be a two-step thing even, where there's some, some initial, because there, there, there could be a cost that we have not budgeted for to date um, that could be part of more of a long-range long solution. Um, but part of this project will also be potentially widening the Hopkins driveway um, to make it three lanes. So that those are all things that will have to be taken into consideration and something that we will begin to look at this month, um, because it will take a lot of time and it's something that we'll need to communicate really well um, and be prepared at the beginning of the year for some confusion. Uh, so those are things that will be hand in hand with the project. Yeah, I, so, so thank you for that update. And, and I, what I would say is I, the, I like the idea of, of starting the year with as much of the new traffic pattern, parking lot pattern, et cetera, for two reasons. One, obviously you're right, trying to change it once they've started and got used to it is a, probably a near impossible task. But also, um, obviously weighing all the operational concerns, if this makes more sense, that's fine. But, but the idea of waiting to start until after the school year starts, I, there's so much that's happening there that I would like tomorrow that yeah, I think yeah. it's right. okay to have yeah. part of it done to, to try to avoid you know yeah. people racing around each other on the right as they're trying to turn left into mm -hmm. the school. I, if people have to learn a slightly new traffic pattern because we did that earlier than you know mm -hmm. mid September, I, I don't mind that. I think some of the safety concerns out there are, and as soon as possible, and will adjust. Mm -hmm. And I also think having it done when before school, when students are not in session probably makes it easier because mm -hmm. I would imagine when once the students are in school, it would be difficult to be working when they're being dismissed. If the just the logistics of the traffic there. If I may the chair um, we did a couple of years ago we did a similar process on Hayden Row between Main Street and where it intersects with Grove so little Hayden Row if you will it's a much shorter section that we're working with now <clears throat> but it's that same type of work where we mill off or scrape off the top pavement and traffic can certainly move around us uh, the milling machine can wait until students are dropped off before it gets out there so we can work with the contractor to ensure that we're not having a great impact on any of the drop off or pick up in the afternoon. But I, I appreciate the, 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 the interest in getting this started as, as quickly as possible. So it's up to the school committee how, <coughs> how you wish for us to proceed. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think as early as you can do it, the better just because of you know, the, the once school starts, we also have to consider, in addition to the parent um, pickup, which we've discussed, a lot of new drivers, inexperienced drivers. And in addition, even though obviously the morning drop off and the afternoon pickup are the busiest times, um, there is really no no time between two o'clock or what one thirty and six o'clock probably where there's no traffic there, just because of sports and after school activities and plays and people are going in and out of all of those driveways constantly um, during that time so I, I, you know I don't I know zero about how you do that construction but um, to the extent that people are I don't know if you're having block off sections of the road or or how that works but it just is going to be I, I, you already know this there's going to be a lot of people there so I think the more that you can do during the summer is to everybody's benefit um, and and I sounds like you've already had a conversation about what the pickup and drop off 
particularly pick up pattern is going to be for the high school, but I Oh, we don't I, know what it's going to be yet. Okay. Just that we need to have the conversation. Yeah. yeah. So there'll have to be a committee, a committee or mm -hmm. something, because I can see a, a big green area where people are currently lining mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, and you're not widening the high school driveway, no. just the Hopkins mm -hmm. driveway. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so that, that one will be tricky. And I think we have issues at the middle school, which may be as much to do with people respecting the rules that we try to put in place. Uh -huh. Right. As we, yep. uh, it's, there's certainly room there. I think it's time to put everything on the table, though. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, could I just throw one thing out there, too? Uh, because we already know we've got all the traffic going in and out of there on a regular basis. Uh, just thinking of, you know, the high school. Uh, the open campus puts right. more traffic on the road. Mm -hmm. Hiller Day adds another level. And I wonder if maybe we would consider um, not implementing that while this uh, area of construction was going on to lessen uh, the amount of traffic going in and out of those schools during construction. Just, uh, just a thought. Through the chair, the, the construction activity, the, the milling is maybe half a day's worth of work. Oh, okay. And then the work on the curbing and everything that occurs in the gutter or in the shoulder so that will not intercept or, or affect the traffic flow. And then when we get to the paving, that's again, maybe half a day's worth of work. Uh, all the other work, the, the line striping can certainly occur at night or okay. on the weekends. So we'll try to minimize our impact to the school operations as much as possible. And we'll work with the contractor to get the work started as soon as possible. We have to rely on their ability to mobilize, but we'll work with them and try to get that started as soon as possible. Well, that's great, and I would just encourage you to keep in close contact with Dr. McLeod yeah, in terms always. of the school calendar and back to school nights and, you know. August 27th is the first night of school. Look at that. <laughs> that's right. But, I mean, Sorry, all, the, all the evening events, and yeah, there's so much happening yes. in the in Yeah, fall. it's wonderful working with Mr. Westerling. That's not not a concern. So, so yeah. one of you or both of you will just mm -hmm. keep us updated sure as will. to your progress over the summer. Mm -hmm. and, okay, and Mina, did, I didn't mean to skip you. Do you have questions? Um, yeah, I guess I just want to, uh, you know, bring up the point about, uh, you know, all the comments that we received at the town meeting, um, you know, I, I don't have a log of it. I just want to make sure that we have looked at those comments thoroughly because we talked about putting everything out there on the table. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Can, can I ask, a, can yeah. I ask a, a, an actual <coughs> like, traffic pattern question? Um, so the, is there a... The, tur the left turn out of Hopkins, does that left turn into a merge lane? Uh, the left turn out of Hopkins, yes. So basically the cars coming straight and the cars coming left could sort of be happening simultaneously and then they merge up there? Yes, that's what this, if you see okay. this, that's why that lane That's what added. that's there for? So that, that, if that person were to come in here, he's still out of the main line of traffic. He's kind of quasi-protected. Yep. So that's why that we've added that lane, because otherwise, okay. you're right, there's a conflict coming out right. here. And so we can come up, accelerate, and then get into, and the then get into that lane. Is the, ye the yellow that's there yep. right after that, will that just be paint, or will there be potentially anything barrier-wise right in there? Right now it's paint. Right it's now it's paint, paint. okay. Yeah, paint yep. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on the concept? Any other questions on the project itself? Thank you, Robin. Great. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you for the update. Good. Thank you. Okay, and a water tank. And through the chair, we have Michael Warner. If you want to come up, please. Michael Warner is one of the design engineers with Weston and Sampson. We did have a pre-construction meeting today at which uh, Dr. McLeod and Mr. Dumas attended, and that included uh, the Department of Public Works, the building inspector, the fire chief, and the contractors. And what we did was to talk about the construct, the destruction of the existing tank, which has lead paint on it, as we know, the remediation of the soil between the parking lot and the fence, which has lead contamination, as we know, uh, and the schedule of work for the tank. And I was very heartened with the fact that a lot of the, the takedown of the existing tank will occur in the summer. Uh, also, the fact that the footprint of the contractor's work is going to be contained within the fenced area. So even though our 
construction of the new tank will extend into the school year. It's not going to impact the flow of traffic through there. It's not going to take up any parking spaces. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Mike so that he can talk about the proposed schedule in general when we're looking at takedown and construction and also the remediation of the soil and the takedown of the tank to ensure that there's we're following all of the regulations, it's done by a certified contractor, and that there'll be uh, minimal, we're going to make our best effort to, to eliminate any possible exposure or release of, of lead in the environment. Mike? Good evening. Thank you. Um, as John said, we met with the, the contractor, the general contractor today that's, that's involved in the, or responsible for the whole project. Um, they indicated to me today, to us, that uh, they're actually interested the day after school's out of, of trying to mobilize uh, some equipment and, and basically just get started so that they can attack things in earnest the following week or um, in, in July, starting in July in order to get the tank, uh, demolish the tank, remove uh, any of the soils outside of the fenced in area and do any of that um, remediation work or dismantling work before school is in session. As John said, June 27th, I think, was was pretty much, uh, you know, it's was, was burned into everyone's minds at this point. August. August, sorry, wow. Yeah, yeah. Not very that's true. Right. Right. <laughs> August 27th, so that's that's the goal, is to get all of uh, um, that work completed. Um, you're looking at um, into, into September, probably, is, is when they're going to start the actual tank erection but um, this particular tank contractor, they have a very, they, they need a very small footprint, so I, I, I can imagine that uh, you'll almost kind of even barely notice that they're going to be there. There's going to be some workers on, on site with, uh, with the boss cat, and that's basically all the equipment that they need. Um, you'll see more of, more of the equipment and more, uh, more of the major activity will be, will be in that July, uh, August area, or uh, time frame. Uh, they are expecting to uh, there's some site work and some um, electrical work that needs to happen, and that would extend into into December, is when they were projecting to have the whole project completed. Um, they were hopeful, depending on the weather, maybe they can shorten that up, but that's what they were kind of projecting for the time being. Um, and then in talking about the, the soil uh, remediation or removal, um, as John indicated, all of it will be done as a uh, under state and federal guidelines and codes. Uh, we're waiting for submittals on health and safety plans for the, the, the workers that will be um, dismantling the tank. Um, as part of the contract documents, they're required to submit the health and safety plan that, that needs to uh, account for air monitoring and personnel monitoring um, uh, so, uh, so that everyone is, uh, um, is, uh, is Kept in uh, kept in line and and, and uh, that, that everyone's health and safety is uh, is supporting. Um, and as far as I think, as, as everyone knows, that the, the soil uh, outside of the fenced in area will be removed and taken off site and replaced with uh, nice clean soil. So will all of the lead then be gone when this project is done? So if I, if I can address that, Madam Chair, the, the lead that's in the soil, we, it's our intent to protect the public from contact with it. And we can do that through one of two ways. One is to keep the public from accessing that soil. And the second is to remove the soil. So on the site, we're, we're taking two <coughs> approaches. Between the parking lot and the fenced in area where the public can access, we're going to remove that soil and put down fresh soil. Uh, the area within the fence, we're going to keep the fence up, and that will keep the public from being coming into contact with the soil. If you'll remember, uh, this past year we extended the fence line out to the street to further contain the soil. Uh, so, so all of the lead will not be removed, but it will be the public will be prevented from coming into contact with it. And the one thing about lead contamination is that you have to actually ingest the soil right. to have it be a threat. Uh, the grass isn't a threat. Mowing the grass isn't, isn't a threat. It's just ingestion. 
and there's not risk of any kind, I, I don't know a lot about lead, but of the soil that's in there washing and being eroding into the area outside? Runoff. Runoff, thank you. Uh, during construction, they, they would be, um, they're, uh, they need to set up uh, silt fencing and um, barrier fencing to just to, to try to keep that, uh, any possibility of that happening uh, to a minimum so that it, it shouldn't be an issue during construction. Mina, did you have any questions about the water tank replacement? <coughs> okay. Um, so um, you mentioned that the uh, the construction of the new water tank will continue will occur partially during the school year so uh, I'm not sure actually which direction I'm going with this do we Corey clear anybody who's working on that site they're there it, during as, the as long as they're on school property during school hours Correct. we go through all the yeah we okay will. Mm -hmm. okay may I just yes, add um, during the pre-construction meeting um, we had many of the same questions, and it was very reassuring, obviously, and, and it shouldn't be surprising, um, to know that the engineering company, most of my concerns were the same around the lead piece and working with Costello Engineering, is that correct? Um, basically, following all the engineer standards and requirements, there are very detailed requirements that they have to go through whenever they're remediating soil in this way or even taking the lead off of the, they, they went into great detail about how they actually move the, the tank and remove the paint chipping, you know, actually goes inside the tank and they went into great detail about that. It was very reassuring um, having also knowing nothing about this to realize that, you know, how professionally, of course, um, this is being managed and, and I left with, with no concerns at all. Jennifer, did you have any questions? No, no, you covered them all. Thank you. Um, it's pretty I thorough. I just have a couple of questions. Is the fencing going to go back to the original when, at, when this is over, is, it, is the fencing going to remain where it is currently, mm -hmm. or it's going to go back to where it originally was? It's going to remain where it is at. Okay. Um, and is this a noisy project? I'm just thinking we've had some issues recently regarding abutters in that area with things that are loud. Is this something noisy that the abutters need to be made aware of? Good question, Madam Chair. The, 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 the teardown will probably be noisy. Um, the work will occur between 7 a.m. and 5 p.m. at the latest, so we will fall within the noise bylaw. Um, but it will be for a very short period of time while they're taking the tank down, and then they, they remove it by dumpsters. Uh, then we'll move in, and we will form the, the walls and the floor, and we'll pour the concrete, so that's not a very noisy project. And then it's interesting, the way that the tank comes, it comes in segmental panels, five feet tall by nine feet wide. Uh, they are rounded and they come on a pallet. And what they do is they bolt them all together on the ground. So it, it's a bolting process. So the first set of panels will go in, they're only five feet tall, and then they'll construct the roof on it. Oh. And I, I can just imagine the pictures that people will be taking and saying, why did we build a water tank that's only five <laughs> feet tall? <laughs> what they do then is it's a jacking system. The entire thing is jacked up to a height where they can slide in the next five foot tall segment. So it goes from five feet to 10 feet to 15, all the way up to the 70 foot maximum. It's like the Stanley so Cup. Pardon me? It's like the Stanley Cup. <laughs> yes, exactly right. Yeah. So it's, it's a, it's a, it'll be a quiet construction project, relatively speaking, and the, the jacks are, are electric, so it's, it's not gonna be a lot of noise. So that loud part that you're mentioning is not when school is finished? That'll be this summer. Okay. And this is just complete ignorance, but curiosity, where's the water go when you're taking them down, in between taking one down and putting the other one up? So we'll, we'll drain the tank. It's, it's approximately a 70 foot tall, tall tank. Yeah. We'll drain it down to a point of eight or nine feet when the hydraulics no longer allow it to drain. And then we'll have to pump it out. And it just goes back into the system. We're going to have very green fields, they said. Okay. That's what I was going to say. Oh, we're going to definitely build a football this year. Yeah. yeah. We just channel it right down the football field. All right. Very good. Does anybody else have any questions? No. Nope. And we don't have to take any action. Mm -mm. But this was very informative. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for taking the time to come. It's really helpful. Thank you all very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, guys. See you later. So let's not make it another six years, okay? okay. <laughs> Anytime, John. Um, should, should we ask? <laughs> Okay, so if you are ready 
Mr. Hanna, we have, we're so excited to hear your F-1 visa program update. Sure, thank you. Bring up with me Andy Longoria, who's one of the assistants to the F-1 program. He's our uh, top recruiter as well, so he can answer any questions that you have, and also he should be publicly recognized tonight as a key member of our F-1 uh, team. So first of all, I'd like to thank you, the school committee, for approving last year an ability for us to increase the number of F1 students that Offington High School is able to accept uh, up to 21, which is how many were recruited and secured for the 2016-17 year. It was really, a, in my four years here, as the uh, overseer of the program and working along with Andy, I think we both agree it was the most successful year yet. Um, so we had 21 students coming from countries, uh, Germany, China, Italy, Thailand, Brazil, Colombia, and Japan, uh, to name a few. Uh, but what was the best part of our program this year was our ambassadorship that really kind of took the Hopkinton students and brought them in at a much more personal level uh, to interact with our friends from all over the world. And Andy was a key uh, member of that team, along with one of our foreign language teachers, Laura Tice. And so at this point, I'd like to allow for Andy to talk for a couple of minutes about what the ambassador program looked like and why it was uh, that your participation and support in increasing the number to 21 students allowed for this successful program to continue to grow. The, the initiation of the ambassador's program was um, a direct result of me surveying uh, outgoing foreign exchange students. What, what did you like about our program? What did you like about Hopkinton, the student body? Uh, but also be critical. What, what could we do better? And without that kind of feedback, I don't think a program can continue to improve and, uh, and, and be positive and have positive impact on not only our students, but, but our exchange students. Mm -hmm. And a, a consistent uh, response from our exchange students was they had difficulty getting introduced, uh, getting involved with other students, getting to know other students on a, on a different, um, a different, in a different way. Um, yes, they join groups, but those groups may meet once a week, uh, maybe even once every two weeks, so they really don't get a chance to meet with them and, uh, and get to know students. The most successful um, uh, uh, you know, involvement with our exchange programs were th those students that participated in sports, because those, they participated with you know, uh, fellow students and peers every day and for a variety of reasons they need to they need to rise they have they had reasons to mm. get involved so that triggered the thought of, of of creating an organization designed specifically not only to uh, bring them into and engulf them into our community but also have an opportunity for them to share with relationships and build relationships with them with, with our with our students and those students in turn uh, get a chance to really see and, and recognize that we are uh, more uh, the same than, than different. And um, last night, yesterday after school, was their final meeting, the Ambassadors Club final meeting. And everyone that were running for office had to make a speech as people are running for president, vice president, whatever. Um, and uh, Laura Tice, who was there, and I'm sure you can attest that it was nearly, it was bringing us to tears, mm -hmm. the testimonials that they were presenting, why they're doing what they're doing, why they want to be involved with, with this particular organization was in, incredibly moving. And um, and at this point, I, I was just like, I was just, I had to say some words at the very end and, and talk about how uh, appreciative not only the administration was of their efforts, but also to see, to, to you guys to look at each other and recognize what you just did this year. Well, after one year, had the involvement that you had 80, we had 80 students show, sign up for this organization initially. I mean, we had to have two separate meetings, and, and it was standing room only in, in, the, in the classrooms. Uh, it, you know, eventually by attrition, they kind of, and involvement with other things, they, that whittled down. But there's still a strong commitment to this program and, 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 and the involvement of, of them. So uh, I'm extremely thrilled at how this year ended. Uh, I, I couldn't be more pleased with the participation of the students and their commitment to to that and their commitment to improving for next year. They've already started planning. They're talking about what they want to do. They're having uh, monthly meetings, uh, uh, actually actually, yeah, bi-weekly meetings, and, uh, and monthly events and smaller events beyond that. They're already planning those. So um, they, they're, they're dedicated and in, in, in involved students. I'm, I'm truly been always impressed with the student body anyway. 
but uh, this took it to another level for me. So I just wanted to let you guys know that they're awesome. Andy does great work recruiting around the world. One of our goals is to make sure that our F1 population isn't from particular areas. So we work with a number of different organizations because they all have uh, footholds in different parts of our globe. And our you know, philosophy is to try to bring in as many cultures, as many perspectives as possible so that our students here in Hopkinton are able to hear from perspectives around the world in their history classes and math classes, et cetera. So uh, Andy does a great job making sure each cohort is as diverse as possible. We really are able to, uh, and because of the successful uh, program that Hopkins High School has to offer, we're an elite community for a lot of these students to participate in. So we are able to pick the cream of the crop, which he does an excellent job with. Uh, next year, we have another uh, one other country being represented in our cohort from Vietnam. But again, we're at a 21 uh, person uh, kind of cap, which is perfect. Doesn't stress out our systems uh, too much, but it also allows for our students to experience the world that we're all growing up in. I, I put a philosophical statement down talking basically about as our world continues to shrink hour by hour, the importance of relationships across cultures, across countries, across our globe is so is such an important skill for a 21st century high school graduate to have to allow to compete at a high level at the university and college level. And clearly, we're doing a pretty good job here because a number of our students decided to stay stateside uh, for their university experience. Penn State, know. Michigan State, um, George Washington, George Washington uh, the UMass District, and, 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 and so on. So we're excited that our friends are enjoying their time here in the United States enough to continue their study. So we'd be happy to answer any questions you have, but our big thank you is to, for allowing us to grow the program to create as positive experience as possible. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, I, I have a question, actually. I, I was actually completely ignorant about how Hopkinton fell into the F-1 visa program, so I was looking up a ton of information when I saw it on the, on the um, agenda. How, many, how long have, you been inv have we been involved in the program? How long has the school? Been, a while. Not even 11. 2011. 2011? And have, have you both been working on it since then? I, or? So I started four years ago, yeah. and we picked up Andy as one of our recruiters as the um, Department of Homeland Security, which is like the visa set us paperwork that I'm more in charge right. of is, is certainly time consuming and detail oriented and we needed to make sure that we were recruiting the best classes we created uh, a kind of support for that role with where Andy came on about at that time yeah. so previous show coach who's in the audience was kind of uh, overseeing the program as well he helped coach me up on some of the more intricate parts of you know meeting with uh, members of the Homeland Security who will come intermittently throughout the year to make sure that our processes are secure and in line with their expectations, and we've continued to pass their uh, pop quizzes and tests. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so, Mr. Hanna, you actually anticipated my question. It's gr glad to hear that the number is exactly what it. Um, what it should be a perfect number for you so that that's that's great. I was going to yeah. comment towards that. Yeah. Um, that number we're actually at more critical mass at this point. That was it. Uh, the difficulties in um, in. Uh, recruiting this number of, of students is identifying host families so we question. you know that is really the the the, the, the guiding um element in, in in how much we how many kids we can recruit without host families we can't do this mm -hmm. and uh, i certainly would if anybody who's out there looking at this and, and their host family time we want us to say how appreciative we are that they open their homes and their hearts to these students and, and provide them an opportunity to be here and get, I mean, this is a, a quality education for the price of, I mean, we're talking, like we're averaging whether the state average of mature, but, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bargain. It's a bargain for, um, for, um, for our exchange students. I mean, we, we offer uh, an, an incredible opportunity and experience and that really is something that they can, their families can afford, so that's really Thank, thank you for raising that because you're right. I mean, you obviously you both and, and others do such an, an incredible job making this program possible. But those host families are, are critical to that too. So, um, thank you for raising that. And then the other the other thing I was just going to say is, um, the 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 best part of this job is or the number of meetings where we get to either hear directly from students or hear about the, the things that our students do that still continue to amaze us. So, I I, I can't say I'm surprised to hear that our students stepped up to the plate like they did for that ambassador program but it's just always nice to have the reminders of what extraordinary students we have here in hopkinton um, and thank you for for making this possible 
I just want to thank you also, but, but it, it provides such value <laughs> on both sides of the students coming in, but also for our students at the high school. I know just mostly anecdotally of how much they add to the student body and how much the students enjoy having them here. I hear about kids who are then going to visit students who have been here last year, the year before, and whatnot, and it's a nice world connection for our kids to be able to make. A ripple effect of this program is that some these agencies that, um, that bring students here offer scholarships, and they made a, uh, one of those agencies made a presentation to our student body at the end of last, uh, last beginning of the year um, and asked our students, are you interested in doing abroad travel in the summer? And, um, and through my contacts with them and, 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 uh, and getting some inside information, they said, you get these kids in, get their applications in by a certain date, there's just, there's all kinds of money out there for them. Well, all those students, I think it was seven or eight of those that got their applications in by that first deadline, all got scholarships for travel this summer. So wow. we're not only this type of, to, to reverse the action and, and, mm -hmm. and, and have them go out and experience what they, what the exchange students come here to experience. And, and that is, um, that's just the beginning. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just feel that this program is gonna get stronger and better and more involved and our students are gonna, you're gonna see our students doing more travel abroad. We have one that's finishing up a full year in France, an uh, exchange student uh, program, a student of mine as a matter of fact, and uh, who's using one of the agencies that we are using. So that, that's the contacts and that's the experience that they're, that's open to our students, your kids, um, um, every, every year. That's great. Nina, did you have anything you want to add? Yes, I, I want to congratulate uh, both gentlemen for the wonderful program that they're running. This sounds amazing to me. Uh, what is also amazing is that you're collecting feedback from students and incorporating that. So kudos to you for that. I'm actually very curious um, to hear the testimonials that brought tears to your eyes. <laughs> I'm wondering if it's possible at all for us to hear, uh, hear it somehow. Well, you as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm about to solicit uh, their testimonials that they presented in, in at, the, at their meeting. I would like to have that as part of um, the scrapbook kind of thing that we're um, just, we're still we're beginning to pull together. There's a, um, a video that was um, generated by a who is now going to be president of, a, of, the, of the ambassadors uh, next year. She generated a video of, of their activities, um, uh, and I, I'd love to have the opportunity to share that with the committee. Oh, it's, uh, it is it is a moving um, moving tribute to the year and to their efforts, and so mm -hmm. absolutely I would welcome that. Well, that would be wonderful. Thank, Thank you. I I have. Thank you. Sorry, Gina, I just have one last question. Sorry. Sure. Um, now, it seems that, uh, you know, as I understand, these are kids at the high school level, right? That right. Program, that program. And have you considered, or are, are there any avenues for uh, these kids uh, on the FN program to interact with kids in middle school or elementary school? Um, do those kids also get the benefit of having this, um, you know, this perspective? So you mean in terms of recruiting for our middle school and elementary school? I'm not sure if I... No. Oh, you mean having them interact? From an interaction perspective, yes. Uh, their interactions would be generally limited. If they're, if they're uh, members of the host family, they're mm. certainly getting in, involved with, um, with that kind of exchange. I know that several members of the Ambassadors Club um, have been hosting uh, for quite a few years, and so if that, if that was the case from what they told me, They've had this experience since middle school. That's really the only ex exchange that I know of uh, that, uh, that's going on with uh, the middle school age uh, students. We have a public international night, which is a nice evening in usually mid-October that's open to the public. So that would be an opportunity for elementary and middle school kids to come and taste some of the food <coughs> around the world and see, hear, hear some of the music, et cetera. But you know, we could look into ways to expand our experience throughout the year and try to connect with some of our elementary and middle school kids to kind of widen that cultural exchange for sure. That'd be great, thank you. Well, that might help you recruit more host families too. Yes. Right. Um, I've been here, uh, around here for a long time and I had the pleasure of being on the school committee when we instituted this program. And so I just, 
I, I just am so amazed every year, but most particularly this last year and maybe the year before, at how much depth you added to the program, um, not just because we have additional students, but just the, the thought that you've put into it, adding the ambassadors has clearly been a huge you know, game changer in terms of the experience that our own students are having, but also obviously that the um, that the foreign exchange students are having. And I learned something a month ago that I didn't know, which is that all of the foreign exchange students, whether they're juniors or not, are invited to attend the prom so they can experience that kind of thing. And so that's the kind of thing that I mean, that just the thought that you've put into it and the richness of the experience that you're offering these students who are coming here, not just the academic experience that we obviously know is tremendous at our high school, but just giving them really the flavor of what it's like to go to high school in the United States, regardless of what class year they're in, um, is tremendous. So you are doing a fantastic job, and uh, just kudos to you. It's been it's been a pleasure to watch it develop, and I can't wait to see what happens next year. Mm -hmm. so thank you. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure from the inside out. Absolutely. From an operations perspective, I, I want to throw some bouquets Josh's way. He always remembers to let the transportation office know who the students are oh, and where you. they're going to live so that we can get them on buses. And that's kind oh of important. It's the little things. The little things are really important, right? Yeah, that's awesome. That's, that's cool. yeah. Nice. <laughs> Nice. I, that's not what I thought you were going to say. I really, I really hope Susan knows that she has to bring everything back to transportation <laughs> right, at these meetings. Right. We've been told it's going to be yet. important. I thought you were going to tell us how much money we've raised. Right. Yes. That's well, what we thought you were going. Just Which look in the budget one. book. It's in there. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Exactly. That's not the most important part, but it's Absolutely. a nice. But we never say no to that. So. That's right. Right. Well, thank you both. Thank so you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now, I'm, so now we're going to move to the assistant superintendent's report. Okay, so I'll ask Dr. Kavanaugh to come up, and is Mrs. Lipinski coming up now? No, no. She'll take care of that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. While uh, they're getting the, the presentation ready, I just wanted to let the school community know that, as you know, often we have our presentations in the packet, and sometimes we don't, and, and we do that purposefully um, because we want to have a, a discussion. And so the school committee has not seen this presentation. For those at home that might have been looking for it ahead of time, it will be posted tomorrow um, on our website. I know there were people that wanted to be here that weren't able to be here, um, and I just wanted to make sure there was no confusion about the fact that it wasn't in the packet. Um, we feel that sometimes presentations, there's so much richness that goes to the presentation itself that is lost in just the slides when the slides are provided um, in isolation. So um, Dr. Kavanaugh will go through her presentation. Um, I know that Mrs. Lachansky and she have worked on this together um, along with Mr. Bishop and there's been lots of time put into it and we're looking forward to it. Um, and, and then it will be up for everyone to be able to to see um, on the home web page tomorrow. <coughs> Was that magical? It's like a disco Great. thing happening there. Well, it's recognizing the computer, but it's not recognizing the presentation. Okay. So I was just talking about posting it for tomorrow and why it wasn't in the packet. Um, but I think. Is that okay? Should we do that? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing you can't. Do you want to give it a minute or do you want to ask Karen to? I think they just made that decision. Is that okay with you? Yep, that's okay. fine with me. Okay, so, so we're going to, just for the minutes, the ease of minutes, we're actually going to move to eight, <coughs> um, which is the CPAC task list. And Dr. Zaleski is going to go through that with us while we sort out our technology for I. Uh, anybody in the audience, there are copies up here of Dr. Zaleski's presentation. If people want to make notes, um, right here at the end of the table, the committee has a copy. 
I will, um, if I may, set this yes, up. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I want to thank CPAC and um, for the invitation that they gave to all of us, all of you, um, to a meeting where we attended where um, I think the common goal was, was increased communication and, and, uh, and education, really, understanding. Um, at that meeting, there was a task list that was presented, um, and, and it, it felt like this was CPAC's meeting and not a time for you know, discussion around logistics. Um, but after the meeting, Dr. Zaleski and I did, did have some follow-up conversation, particularly because the task list was very much tied to the strategic plan. Um, Dr. Zaleski's goals, the goals that I've had for Dr. Zaleski, um, and my evaluation of her um, over the past couple of years. So it was really important to both of us that she have an opportunity to report back to school committee um, on our joint um, understanding of where Dr. Zaleski is at re as it relates to the tasks. What she has done is taken the task list and, and presented each of the tasks as a separate slide, um, along with her commentary and um, her assessment of whether or not it continues to be open, closed, um, and the work that she has done. So with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank, Thank you for you being so here. So I appreciate the opportunity to come back to you folks and, and just kind of tie up some loose ends and help you folks have a, a better understanding of where I am with my work with CPAC. Um, to Dr. McLeod's point, we've worked very closely on many of these items, and, and again, I'm excited to report out tonight. So the first item, as you can see, is communication. Um, the board was concerned with um, just, just having some uh, breaks in communication from time to time between the board and families. So the first item of concern was school messenger and student service email being set up. So what we did was, after that presentation, went back in, in the office and we looked at how many families were set up and how many families were not set up. We did some troubleshooting, and then um, those that were set up, we just you know provided you know, notification to the board that we had many, most of the families were set up, that 23 families were not set up. So we sent a hard copy mail to them, because we didn't have an email, um, and with, with instructions about how to get set up for, for contact. Um, certainly, as with any parent in the district, school messenger can be addressed also at the building level and they can have the opportunity to receive support that way, because one of the concerns of families was, what if they don't know how to set up on their own, they need some help with that. So in speaking with the building principals uh, across the board, they're certainly more than willing to assist and work with technology teams to help with that. Um, another item that we got in communication was the um, district IEP survey. We hadn't had data, um, any, any data collected wasn't coming in over the past year, so the hyperlink we found out was not working. So what we did was we, again, troubleshooted that and put a new link on so parents have access. Also, um, in addition to fixing the hyperlink issue, I um, ensured that each IEP packet has a reminder. And then what my administrative support team is gonna do is they're gonna be providing quarterly updates to families and reminders. And I have to say, since we've done that, just in the short time of May, we've gotten several survey responses already, which are positive. So we're really excited about that. I also put a reminder in the main newsletter as to what we're doing with communication. Um, continuing the discussion of communication, there was a concern that um, Mr. Mazur and <coughs> the CPAC re representative hadn't had the opportunity to meet. So we had agreed as a CPAC board to put together a meeting discussion to discuss e ESY key points. And um, unfortunately, due to various reasons, we had a lack of parent volunteers at the time. So the head of CPAC did outreach uh, Mr. Mazur. They did end up connecting, and they did have a meeting, and that took place um, in November. And um, the final concern with communication was, as of March, the CPAC board was concerned that they felt they hadn't had a student service update impacting communication, particularly around ESY. I was a little confused about that because I send out monthly newsletters with all of my communications. Um, but some parents were able to access it, and other parents had said they hadn't seen it at the building level. So just as a matter of reminder, I sent out um, notification to the building principals just reminding them to upload my newsletter in a timely fashion. And I don't think it was fault on one side or the other. I felt it was a timing issue. My newsletters go out at certain times, and principal emails go out, and newsletters go out at different times, and sometimes the newsletters miss each other. So we cleared that up, and we just communicated that to ensure that there's more effective communication on both ends, so everybody's getting the newsletters in a timely fashion, because that contains most of my information. 
Um, so this was a new item on the communication. We had talked about formulating an ESY committee to address ESY concerns, and we agreed on a deadline of June 16th for the committee formulation. I'm excited to say we have um, 10 folks that are already agreeing to join, some from the school side and from the parent side, and I'm currently working with the head of CPAC right now to pick some dates. So uh, we are confident that we're gonna get it underway. I believe we have a school committee member on that. On that we have, we <laughs> have Ms. Nancy Cavanaugh, we're no. very excited, <laughs> who has joined our CSY committee. And um, like I said, we're looking forward to the opportunity because I feel like it's gonna be a really great opportunity to communicate and collaborate just around some of the real pressing issues about ESY because there's a lot of legislation that go governs ESY and oftentimes it's very confusing to families, whether it's transportation or just operations programmatically. And this is just gonna be a lovely opportunity for all of us to clear up those items, to really analyze legislation, and to come to some agreements about how we can set up guidelines. That's very understandable and user-friendly on both sides. Um, and the, my goal is to provide a presentation to the school committee of the outcome of that in September. Dr. Zaleski, before you continue, um, and if I could just clarify, when you say closed um, yes. under your communication, um, you're referring to um, some tasks that you had in place with CPAC jointly. Um, clearly, your goals around communication are ongoing uh, yes. with parents, and, and so that's never like over closed. But I think it, if you can clarify that language, it, it's really to do with certain tasks. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay. I appreciate that. That was no upset on my part. I apologize. <laughs> the so, on communication. Right, communication is never closed, <laughs> then we wouldn't operate. <laughs> But the, what it closed refers to throughout this, these, this presentation tonight, um, on the tracker system that CPEC had presented, they had items as open, meaning feeling they hadn't been addressed. And so what I did with Dr. McLeod was really analyze all of the work that I had done throughout the year and then put together this presentation to further clarify what has been worked on. That's what we mean by closed. So it doesn't mean it's done, one and done, we're never gonna look at it again. It's just, it's closed for the matter of a topic on CPEC agendas. So we can move forward as a group. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Does that clarify, Dr. Clark? For me, yes. Is that, okay. 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 So, um, a guidance issue <laughs> has come up with the ongoing concerns that high school students don't have access to career fairs and information like other students. So, directly following the March meeting, I um, followed the March 21st CPAC meeting, I had a meeting with Mr. Bishop as well as Ms. Greco, and who's the guidance coordinator at the high school to ensure that all students have that ability and access and that their timelines are set up so they can receive the same information as students. And she actually, um, a, a day later, from CPAC outreach to parent, um, a key CPAC parent, to um, inform her of the procedures and um, what the setup is gonna be uh, moving forward. So, uh, you know, I'm willing to continue to discuss this with uh, parents if they still feel they're not getting the adequate level of communication that they need, but I do feel confident that Myself and high school folks have a good working plan to ensure that all students are included in these activities. Mm -hmm. um, so MCAS is an ongoing issue. One of the questions was who the results get sent to, existing um, or out of district placements for MCAS results. And so the answer is both. Both Hopkinton Public Schools and out of district placements get received MCAS information and we review it accordingly when we're in our annual meetings and IEP meetings. And then Anytime a parent wants more information, myself along with Connie Shagnon, who's our out district coordinator, meets with the out district placements and we review it both internally and externally as needed. Um, the next uh, few items, uh, parents had requested a better understanding from Dr. Kavanaugh, the assistant superintendent, on the score gap between general and special education children and what initiatives are being implemented for those students. Um, my response to that back in November was that we were going to um, schedule, I'm mean, sorry, not back in the we were going to schedule a curriculum presentation to take place um, in the fall and uh, October and November. Also with that are some other items um, CPEC had asked how we're measuring success of academic initiatives, co-taught, language-based, tier three. So what I'll do is I'll be working with Dr. Kavanaugh to craft that presentation so we can do a real thoughtful presentation capturing all of the curriculum and academic areas of concern um, for presentation at a, in a fall date. Um, one of the things that was brought up was um, dedicated therapy rooms and playground accessibility. Um, they, um, see if I could ask what therapy rooms were gonna be designated in the new building and um, if playground was ADA 
accessible? And the answer is yes. We did discuss that in, C in the March CPAC. It's, it's in the minutes. Um, but what I did, um, although we discussed it in March and parents still had it on their list of concerns, I um, put links to the plan that, that are on the district website into the June newsletter so mm -hmm. that parents can easily access the information if they want to review it themselves and take a closer look. Um, so that information is available for families to look at how we carefully placed all of our therapy rooms in the new building. Um, this question came up, how often do principals <coughs> meet with Dr. Zaleski? So we have a variety of opportunities to meet. We do meet with our admin council, with Dr. McLeod, um, as, an, as an entire administrative group. I have bi-weekly chair meetings, um, but more importantly, I, I meet mostly daily with folks as needed across the district. We have five buildings that I'm working with, and things come up throughout the day, and depending on the need, um, I'm in constant contact with the chairs and principals as things arise. Um, in the morning and the night, we talk, so that's ongoing. And um, also, I regularly report to Dr. McLeod with all structural issues in the district. She is my direct report, so I'm her direct report. And so we you know, communicate. <laughs> <I'm> like, Sorry. Ready <laughs> yeah. so I quickly corrected that. <laughs> so we talk. Some days it feels like that, Karen. Thanks. There you go. So we talk on an ongoing basis. Um, Certainly, you know, lots of things come up in the special education department that impact both general, edu general education and special education. And um, Dr. McLeod and I actually have um, standing meetings as well as mentoring meetings, which are really helpful. So it gives us an opportunity to not only meet when there's like a crisis or something of concern, but we also meet on an ongoing basis just so she is abreast and apprised of all the things that have taken place in, in that department. Because uh, there's so many facets with related service providers as well as special educators. So we have a nice opportunity to have those discussions. May I jump in on Please. this one, Dr. Zaleski, just to say that the purpose of this slide, because it was called out as a task, was to really begin a conversation um, with CPAC about what are the things that Dr. Zaleski will be reporting to them on with respect to their meetings um, as part of her agenda. So, so she attends their meetings and is on their agenda to provide a report. And really coming to some common understanding are what are appropriate things to ask of her um, and, and what are really not, not. Um, and so if there are concerns, typically, of course, those would be, would come up. But, but what Dr. Zaleski is clarifying here as well is, as she has done so often, and I think CPAC is very respectful of this, is not bringing individual student concerns to CPAC. That is not the appropriate place for that. So if there's individual student concerns about any of these roles and responsibilities, this would not be the place. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to clarify here is, is what, you know, just those roles. And I think, you know, everybody working really to get to a really positive common place is, is the goal of, of all of this ongoing discussion. So I just wanted to put that in so it didn't seem as though, you know, this is not a defensive one. It was just yeah. out there that didn't seem to be something Something that Dr. Zaleski would be reporting to to, mm -hmm. to CPAC on. I'm always happy to clarify, but we do want to maintain the most important privacy and family yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. so we'll start program and strategic plan initiatives were all the items that were brought up. Um, parents asked for a link to be added to the school website, so it is on the website regarding the start program and how to access information about the start program, which is available to all students, general education and special education. It's a therapeutic program, for those of you that don't know what the STAT program is, both held at the middle school and the high school for students returning from hospital situations, both medical and psychiatric in nature, or students who have been home for a while for whatever reasons and need to return and have that transition time, that's what the program is. So they were asking for some information, um, and I did you know, research the website and make sure it was up there and updated, so it is there. CPAC asked to better understand my um, special education specific plans moving forward and current initiatives. So at the end of every year, I compile information and usually at the start of the year with CPAC, I do a full overview of where we've been and where we're going. At the time of this request, I wasn't able to provide it to them because we were still working on the strategic plan and finalizing it um, and putting in some action items. So I didn't want to prematurely speak. So we are gonna make a plan for the fall and that this will be an ongoing action. had asked how many learning specialists were in the district, <laughs> and uh, there are two as of March, and we discussed this in March at the CPAC meeting. 
um, and I believe they were at the high school level. And uh, they also asked about the transition coordinator hiring update. I know that the CPAC had done a presentation to you folks, um, feeling like they hadn't had any information, um, which was a little confusing to me because we have put a transition coordinator in place. Actually, at the start of this year, we had a coordinator in place as a stipend position for our high school, and then um, that person was not able to stay in the position. So we did end up contracting with Accept Collaborative, and that was communicated um, to CPAC in March. And um, they were asking about you know, how it affects individuals and critical health as you can see, this is how critical populations and parents have they had meetings. That I couldn't really get into because, again, that's a violation of confidentiality. Who's had meetings, who hasn't, and why the reasoning for that? Because at least that's getting into details of the IEP process. Um, so all this information is on the website as of May and in the June newsletter as well. Um, one specific element that they had asked about was how many hours a month is this person contacted. And so I did put this information here. Um, I don't believe we discussed it since our last topic of, of talking about being hired, the person being hired in March. So it's five hours a month. That's what the contract <coughs> is. It's through a grant right now. And, um, you know, it's my hope at the end of this school year to gather some data around how that initiative is working and what the needs are moving forward. I did contract with that person um, who accept collaborative for next this coming school year as well. And that will help inform my budget decisions moving forward into FYI. Can I ask it, just a clarifying question about what the waivers are? Sure. So, um, so we have learning specialists on waivers at the high school. So, um, so we have folks in positions who um, have a lot have done, like for instance, a lot of coursework, and their DESE um, approved uh, certification hasn't necessarily come through yet. So, usually, what what happens is the Department of Education we have to demonstrate to them with all the information we have upon hire that they've met the majority of the criteria, then the Department of Education, if we want to hire the person because we feel like they're going to meet highly qualified status and we feel like they're a great candidate for the position, DESE has their own criteria. It's a real strict criteria, by the way. Um, they don't easily give out waivers. So when they do give out a waiver, they're confident in our decision, and then they put a timeline on it. So we have two folks in that position right now who are actively moving toward um, certification. And and, okay, so by the end of the timeline, then they have the oh, absolutely. certification. Oh, they have okay. to. They have to be, remain employed, so that okay. is one of the stringent criteria. But again, they look very carefully at the person's schoolwork, coursework, and you know what are they finishing. It could just be the final piece of an internship um, to get the license, and um, and again, they let us know if we can put the person on a waiver before we can even hire the person. So that's the position. That makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. And so transportation. This was primarily about accept transportation. Um, there was uh, questions around when's the communication going to be scheduled to parents, what's happening with the survey, driver testing standards. So um, these issues were addressed in both December and March at the CPAC meetings uh, for the meeting minutes. Um, so just to clarify, Accept Collaborative puts out a survey. They've already put it out to parents around who's going to require transport. This is all pertaining to the upcoming ESY. Um, Accept has worked a very collaborative collaboratively with us this year to develop timelines which we put out to CPAC um, and they've been they've been true to their word around those timelines. So the surveys went out, all the forms went out, we have all the information about who's coming and going and who needs transport, when and where. Um, one of our administrative assistants in my office, I have two administrative assistants in the student service office specifically. Um, one of them is assigned specifically to transportation, which is a daily task that we have for transportation for our district, both for in-district and out-district students. But she's collaborating daily on and troubleshooting daily concerns with transportation as well as bigger picture items like ESY. So um, we've done a really great job at that and the surveys have already gone out, we've gotten information back and we also have all the information out regarding ESY and how they handle transportation. Um, that Except has specific driving standards that they adhere to and um, you know all their drivers are up to par with their standards. Our drivers are um, upon you know receiving a license, they have an application process they need to go through, and they have to meet certain licensing requirements. So that's what our drivers go through, um, and all of our drivers. We make sure that they have done that as well as the Cory and fingerprinting, which we do here in the district as well, to ensure that we have you know, good people driving our kids. So. This is the last item. Um, Co-talk classroom is a new item. Parents have requested the percent of students, how many are on IEPs versus general ed, and they wanted progress data on the different classroom models and how is progress being measured. 
So this was on the April CVAC agenda, and the agenda, we have agreed to co-plan the agenda, but unfortunately in April it was really tricky, and we didn't get the chance to co-plan it, um, so this was placed on the agenda. So I had responded to CPAC via email stating that I was not prepared to discuss this. Um, it didn't work out anyway because CPAC had canceled the meeting. We had agreed to do a, a different date. Um, so I'm leaving that as an open new item because it, it warrants future discussion. We just only to be prepared for it and we need to be in agreement you know, to make sure we can come with the data and have good information for everybody. Um, so that concludes my presentation. And if you have any questions? That was very thorough. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I have one question for you, Dr. Zelensky. Sure. Uh, first, uh, uh, first, I want to say thank you for coming back with such detailed responses. I certainly wasn't expecting it. Thank you. Um, it, and I guess my question is, you know, just as the first things first, uh, it was my first CPAC meeting. Um, so I'm not aware how uh, you know, the meetings get conducted. But when I came out of the meeting, one of the things that struck me was the angst in, um, in that meeting. And to me, you know, issues exist and resolution is an ongoing process, but there was a lot of angst there. And I think you handled uh, the session very well. You responded very respectfully, and I'm very appreciative of that. Thank you. But what I would like to understand is, what are the steps that would be taken to make sure that we can address the angst a bit better? And what is it that we can do as a school committee to help? Thank you, that's a very good question. So it is my hope this year to have an enhanced collaborative relationship. I think that communication is key. So as you saw, the first three slides are all about communication. And I think one of the ways that we're gonna help bring down the anxiety is through enhanced communication measures. So by tightening up both email communication as well as the communication when I'm at the CPAC meetings, that combined with the formulation of the ESY committee, because the ESY committee really is setting the stage for the work we're doing this summer, which is gonna fall into the school year. I think that's gonna give me an opportunity to have a closer partnership with some folks. Whereas what's, what's tricky, and I appreciate that you bring this up, because it really is a, a real concern. Parents feel anxiety, and it, it can be anxiety provoking to talk about some of these topics. And I only meet once a month with this larger group. So I think it's a nice opportunity to formulate the committee that we have that we're st starting with so I can develop a closer partnership with them. And I also think it's helpful, um, Ms. Kavanaugh is gonna be joining the, the committee as well. And she has also, as you know, been appointed as the CPAC liaison. And I think it's, it's nice to have her coming in fresh to try and help and give some new ideas we also have some um, younger members that are joining CPAC as well from the younger grade levels. So I think the more folks that join and, and the more opportunities I have to develop closer partnerships by way of committee and new school committee member, it's gonna help enhance that and hopefully take down the anxiety level. I, I, I'm willing to brainstorm though because I don't have all the answers. And if you folks as a school committee have any ideas for me how to enhance that partnership, I would really be open to it. Sure, uh, Dr. Zelensky, I don't want you to misunderstand where I'm coming from. I, I think, like I said, you handled it, uh, you know, really, really well that session. Thank you. And I guess, um, you know, just as Dr. McLeod was saying, that there are certain ground rules uh, that need to be set up. If those need to be extended beyond, you know, um, beyond not discussing about your own child and whatnot, if that would help, I, I'm sure you would think of those and you know, all those answers need not be provided here. Um, but if you can keep that in mind as a concern from someone coming in new to the meeting, that would be great. That's really great and advice because I forgot about the norms. And I think revisiting the norms and maybe adding to the norms as a committee is very helpful. I think that would be very helpful. Thank you for the suggestion and thank you for the compliments. I appreciate it. Anybody else? No, no I questions. Just, I wanted to thank you also for the update. This was this is, represents a lot of work, and I know it wasn't all done in between the time that we attended the CPAC meeting and tonight. But mm -hmm. it's really helpful to see it all, you know, sort of. I, I won't say it's all tied up because you still have some ongoing things, but so much progress has been made. So it's really reassuring to see all of that. But in addition, it, it, so this has been a great way not to leave it, you know, until the fall. But I also 
you know, saw several references to presentations that we'll be seeing in the fall that are sort of a little bit more data driven uh, in conjunction with Dr. Kavanaugh particularly, but I just, you know, in the spirit of communication, I think this is a great way to close out the year, to hear the, to the, to hear the concerns, to let everybody know what the responses have, have been and will continue to be. And, you know, like everything, it's a work in progress and I really, you know, I applaud you for being so open to feedback and for working so hard as you always do on behalf of the students. Um, I know that we have a great support team and, um, and I think these issues, I think, as you said, are, are mostly related to communication and can certainly be ironed out. So thank you so much. Thank you. This was a great presentation. Thank you Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. <coughs> All right, so now in our hopscotch game of reports, we'll switch back to um, Dr. Kavanaugh for the Assistant Superintendent's Report, which will also include the AP Bio recommendations update. <coughs> TV would recognize my machine. I'm now using Mr. Goshen's computer. We tried three. I think we're okay. So thank you for the opportunity to present on AP Science at the high school. Um, this presentation will actually start with sort of a general overview and then we will move into some of the more specifics and where um, kids are enrolling and where they're not enrolling and, and those kinds of things. Um, I would be horribly remiss if I did not thank the Hopkinton High School Science Department, most especially Valerie Lechchansky, who is the subject matter leader there. She has done an enormous amount of work gathering data to put all this together, so thank you. So I start off with the very simple question of what is an AP course? And this comes directly from the College Board website. What the College Board tells us is that AP courses are for motivated and prepared students, and really what they'll be doing is taking college level courses. And I know that at Hopkinton High School, we have an enormous number of students who are very, very motivated. And so I think that the one word here that I really need to explore tonight is probably prepared. So we need to think about what does it mean to be prepared for an AP level course. And then we can also see here that these are college level courses. And at some point, I mean, uh, Lee Greco, the head of guidance, just put together her spreadsheet for this year's graduating class. And we know that 96% of them are heading off to college. So at some point, all of our kids are ready to go to college, but maybe not at age 15. And so that, that's something that this will address as well, and maybe at age 15. So when a high school offers an AP course, we know that the teachers have to participate in professional development to be prepared to teach that course. So that's requisite. The second thing that has to happen is when that teacher writes her syllabus, or he writes his syllabus, he has to submit that to the college board for approval. So there is no AP course being taught anywhere that has not been approved by the college board. And when kids are uh, rated on, on the test that they take at the end of the course, there's a scale that ranks from one to five. If a student scores a five, what it means is that that student is extremely well qualified capable of doing work in an introductory level course in a particular subject at the college level. And really it means that that student scored that five on that day, during that time, so under those conditions. And so a lot of people will ask us, can you get college credit for AP courses? And the answer to that question really is one that is given to us from those colleges. There are some colleges who would tell us absolutely not, we don't take any AP credit. We will promote you from 
taking an entry level course or something like that, but they won't give you any credit whatsoever. What we've tried to do here is to sort of show you um, the disparity between different schools. And so we've chosen three schools that are local schools. Um, the first is UMass Amherst. And UMass Amherst tells us that if a student receives a four or a five on AP Environmental Science, Biology, Chemistry, or AP Physics C, they will give those students credits for those courses. At WPI, and I think this one's very interesting, if you take AP Chemistry in high school and you score a four or a five, for their Chemistry 1010 course, instead of giving you three credits, they will give you one third of the credit for that course or one credit as opposed to three. However, if you look at the biology exam, uh, toward their BB 1000 course in biology, they will give you the entire credit for that course. So it's just an interesting thing. And Clark will give you credit for just one. So as you enter, you can choose. Our next slide shows us the section <coughs> of AP science courses that have been offered last year, this year, and that will be offered next year. In the 2015-16 school year, uh, we had four sections of bio, four sections of chemistry, three sections of AP environmental science, and one, two sections of physics one. So as you look at that, you can see that the AP environmental science and the physics are, are fluctuating a little bit, but the biology and the chemistry have pretty much stayed the same. Next year, in 2017-18, you can see that we are offering a new AP course. It's physics C. It's a calculus-based physics course. So next year, we will have more AP science sections than we have had historically. There will be 15. The next two slides I've included because um, I think that what they tell us about AP biology is very interesting. All of these other courses are going to say a general chemistry course, an introductory course. But when you look at the description for biology, it clearly says it is the equivalent of a two-semester course. That's an enormous amount of learning in biology. It takes two semesters of college for kids to learn what they are actually learning in a single year in this course in high school. Again, you can see these all say introductory, introductory, introductory. This slide here I included, it's a sample question, and I'll tell you after why I did. We don't even need to look at it, but it will be part of the online when, as Dr. McLeod said, it will be posted tomorrow. You may want to go back and look at it. We don't have to I'm, just, it. I'm just glad you're not asking us to answer. Yeah. <laughs> and again, be here all night. <laughs> all of the above. Oh, no. Half of the vocabulary, I'm sure we'll struggle. <coughs> so, what is the typical tra trajectory of a kid who comes into grade nine and graduates from Hopkins in high school? So, in grade nine, our students take intro to chemistry first semester and intro to physics first semester. That can be taken at a college prep level or it can be taken at an honors level. And when students leave there, they go to biology in grade 10. They go to biology in grade 10, one reason that they go there is that at the end of grade 10, they have to take MCAS and most of them will take that in biology and you need that for your competency determination to earn a diploma. But the other thing about biology here is it's offered at three different levels, college prep, honors, and AP. When students leave biology, they can go to chemistry. They can take that at the college prep, honors, or AP level. You'll see soon that there is nothing that says that if you are taking AP biology, you will also take AP chemistry. Um, or that if um, you take AP, and you choose not to take AP chemistry, that you can't move to an AP science senior year. Only about 80% of the kids will take chemistry in grade 11, which is an interesting statistic. The other 20% will choose from those electives that you see right there. Also under those electives, there is AP Biology. So a student could in fact take AP Biology and Honors Chemistry concurrently. Some kids might take Honors Chemistry and Anatomy and Phys. They might take AP Chemistry and Anatomy and Phys. So there's a lot of choice there to kind of mold your own program after you get out of grade 10. And then in grade 12, you can see there's a host of AP Science offerings as well as all of those electives. So a student in Hopkinton could really take seven science classes if they wanted to before graduation. Can I just interrupt you for one second too? I'm not sure if it does, but 
I think we also have even more of that offered through our online courses, right? Like I think my kids are taking PHS. genetics and some others. So yeah. So even beyond that, there are a lot of opportunities for kids. That is true. VHS offers science courses that you know we don't offer in house, so they are able to take that online. Is it common for kids to take the AP Biology in the eleventh grade? I don't believe that that is common. Okay. No. Um, and we will talk in, in a minute about how most schools will actually require biology to be a two-year uh, process. Um, but at Hopkinton, if you are going, I should say AP Biology, um, but if you are taking AP Biology, there is no precursor biology. So if you went, say, over to Westboro High School, you take biology in grade 10, and if you wanted to take AP, it would be an 11th grade course, an additional course. My understanding is that a lot of High school, local high schools do not allow uh, AP Biology in the 10th grade, is that? That is correct. correct. Yeah. So uh, here, this slide right here is an important one. This slide right here will show sort of that fluidity of allowing kids to move from an AP course to an honors course, honors course to an AP course, uh, with, with what, what we like to think would be relative ease. So if you are a student who took AP Biology in 15, 16, so last year, in, in that course last year, there were 96 students enrolled. If you switch over to the 16, 17 column and you look at AP Chemistry, you will also see that there are 96 students enrolled, but they are not the same 96 students. 21 of those students who make up the 96 came from an honors level course. So only 75 of those students are kids who had gone from AP Biology to AP Chemistry. So the notion that once you are in an AP track, that's where you live, that's not necessarily true. Or the opposite notion, if you don't get into it, you never can. That is also untrue because you can see the 21 kids from Honors made their way into AP Chemistry. Um, I will also be very honest with you. Of those 21 students, 10 of those students have returned to the Honors level. So as they got into AP Chemistry for whatever reason, you know they, they found the coursework very challenging, uh, a choice was made to return to the honors level. Of the other 11, uh, some of those kids are doing profoundly well. Uh, I guess what I would look at when I say those 10 kids went back um, is that uh, there may be something about the predictors that we are using in honors level and AP courses that, that seem to show that uh, that there is an area of struggle. And we'll talk a little bit about struggle when we look at some of the social emotional pieces. And again, if you look at 16, 17, moving into this next school year, 93 kids took AP Bio, only 78 of them, well, 76 of them are going to AP Chemistry. Two of those students who are currently enrolled there are coming from the honors course. All right, so how does Hopkinton High School compare to other schools? This slide, and if you are going back to look at this presentation at another time, I would really recommend that you spend some time on this particular slide. Uh, if you take a look at Hopkinton, which is the orange colored one at the top, in the 15-16 school year, 95 students at Hopkinton High School took the AP Biology exam. That constitutes 8.7% of the entire student body. You can go down the percent of entire school list and you will not find a school that had a greater percentage of students taking that exam. And so to kind of make the argument that we may be limiting in our, in our numbers, I think that that percentage speaks volumes to our willingness to say that we are evaluating kids as prepared to take that course. And when you look at the number or the percentage of kids who earned a three or above, of our 95 kids who took that, 96.8 or 97% of them earned a three or above, which means that even though it's a first year course, the instruction must be outstanding for our kids to be able to score three, fours, and fives. Um, and I would also draw your attention to something like Lincoln Sudbury or Medfield. In those towns, they had seven kids and 15 kids respectively take that exam. And when you look at those numbers, you can also see that those are kids who are in their second year of biology. So only 1.8% of the kids in Medfield are actually taking the AP Bio exam, 
but 100% of them are earning those passing scores. And my guess, I don't know this because I don't have access to their scores, but my guess is that those scores will go five, 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 because they've sort of handpicked the kids that they want there, and they've had two years to prepare them. Um, and that, that's not uncommon when we sort of limit our kids. I would argue again that 8.7% says that we are really not limiting our children. So then there's also the question of how many schools are offering courses without prior exposure? Because when we offer biology, we are offering that without prior exposure. There is no bio course that precedes this one. In Holliston, they have AP Physics 1. That's offered without prior physics experience. In Westwood, they have AP Physics 1, AP Chem. Students can take those without prior experience. Wellesley has AP Environmental Science. Natick has AP Physics 1. Canton has AP Physics and AP Chemistry. Um, and the remaining 11 schools that you saw from that previous list do not offer any first year AP Science courses. So if kids have to double AP Bio and double AP, double Chemistry before they get to AP Chem, those kids aren't, don't have the opportunity to take as many APs as our kids do. And so the argument could be made, well, you know, our kids seem to be taking a whole lot of APs. It's because we're affording them the opportunity to. This slide simply shows you historically 2014, 15, and 16, <coughs> what percentage of students at Hopkinton High School are earning fives, fours, threes, twos, and ones, and then it's compared to the national averages. And this just sort of simplifies it for you. The Hopkinton, Hopkinton High School averages are in the middle. In biology, it was 3.7, chemistry 3.4, environmental science 3.0, and physics 1, 3.8. So we are OK with kids earning threes, fours, and fives. We want to afford them the opportunity to take these courses and to learn a lot from those courses. Now here's a question that I think everybody wants more information about. How do we identify the students that are most likely to be ready for the rigors and demands of various AP courses? And we don't take this lightly. This is, this is really difficult for us to determine because some of the information that we use is quantitative and some of the information that we use is qualitative. So we have numerical data, we have class assessments, but at the same time we have habits of work and, and observations that we have about preparedness. So I, I'll talk about that. So when we have our recommendation process, we are, I think, very much invested in making sure our kids are academically challenged. I mean, we don't want kids sitting in classrooms where they are bored. At the same time, we want to make sure the kids are able to be successful. So to put them in places where the reach might be too great is not consistent with our goals around social emotional health. Every single school in this district has an SEL goal. And I think we would be hypocritical if we said we really believe in student social emotional health and then we allowed them to, um, or encouraged them to, or recommended that they put themselves in places where so much energy was going to need to be expended that all thing, all other things, all other healthy things, sports and other things would have to go away. So what criteria do we use? Um, we have the students' averages, and in a moment we'll be able to show you what those averages look like in both intro to chemistry and intro to physical science. And we have other assessment data. While they're in those classes, they're writing lab reports, they're taking tests, and so that assessment data also weighs in. Uh, we have um, the students' average in class assessment data for the second semester course as well. And then these are the ones that tend to be more qualitative in nature. And I think that these are ones where you know, teachers sort of uh, spend a lot of time, they think hard, and, and there's not something that's quantifiable about it. So what do we mean about teacher observations for students' academic readiness? You know, sometimes we will have kids who at five minutes to 12 will send you the email saying, I'm just not going to have that done for tomorrow. Or we have that kid who will tell us, oh my gosh, I spent five hours last night on that assignment. That tells us that they are spending an awful lot of time and spending a lot of energy. And I was in a meeting with Mr. Bishop today where he described what it looks like when kids start to have that 
some sort of emotional breakdown because it just becomes too much. And then the last criterion here um, involves uh, literacy and numeracy. So even though we're talking about science, those things are important. If you have a chance to go back and look at the question that we skipped over, you're going to see that the reading there, the lexical density of that piece is enormous. It would take an awful lot to read that and really comprehend what it was asking you to do. And so our kids need to be able to read that, read it with high comprehension levels, read it understanding all of the vocabulary, and they have to do that relatively quickly because the AP test is a timed test. So if they need to go back and reread that piece three or four times, they're actually kind of losing a lot of momentum and a lot of opportunity to get to the end of the test. Um, and, and the writing piece is also something that we need readiness. In order to write using um, sort of a typical science genre, kids need to be eliminating the first person, writing in the past tense, writing in the passive voice, and having facile access retrieval of all of that science domain specific vocabulary. If a kid isn't there right now, what we, have, what we don't want to tell them is you'll never take AP Biology or you'll never take a college level biology course. What we need to tell them is you're not going to take that yet. Because those skills can be built and time is the common denominator there. Time is the factor that will help our kids get to that place where they can in fact access that curriculum. So maybe not when they're 15, maybe when they're 17, maybe not when they're 15, maybe when they're 19, but they will get there, they will get there. What happens in the AP course is that the curriculum doesn't allow for the teaching of that kind of reading and writing. It's assumed that the students are walking in the door with that, that skill set. That skill set can be built and it can be built at Hopkinton High School and it can be built in a year's time, two years time, depending on reading. This is some of the data that also supports our numerical use. Um, if you take a look at the green columns, the green columns show you what the freshman scores were in intro to chemistry and intro to physics. So that 92 and 87, those were the cut scores that we actually used for this year's placement. Uh, if you look at the kids who are, so I shouldn't say this year, for the kids who are going into the course in 17, 18, so the kids who are currently in the course who had cut scores at 92 and 87, their AP Bio first semester average, test average, just the average that they had on tests was a 71. And when they got halfway through the course and they took that exam grade, they on average had a 63%. Uh, so there is an indication, I think, in 71 and 63 that says when our cut scores are at 92 and 87, there may be struggle. If we bump those numbers up and we say that we'll look at the students who had 94 in chemistry and 91 in physics, when they took the, the their AP Bio test average for the first semester was, went up to an 86, and the AP exam at the end of the first semester went up on average to an 84. Those are huge gains and they are small numbers in terms of what those freshmen uh, scores were at the end of the year, or at the end of those um, half-year electives, half-year semester courses. I don't know. Uh, then if you look at kids who had 96 and 96 in those two courses, you can see that the test average went up to 94, and that the final exam grade went up to 95. Uh, when I look at something like that final exam grade being a 95, one of the things that I can say for sure is that uh, the information that was on that test is cumulative and it's an awful lot of information. It has stopped being in the student's working memory and it has moved to the student's stored memory. Uh, I, I think that I would say that if a student scored a 63, those same conditions would probably not have been met. And I think that it's okay not to be able to take that information and put it into your stored memory now. But what those freshman scores help us to do is to make predictions about whether or not that those conditions can or cannot be met. Uh, the current students who are in the course on a weekly basis, how much time did you put into this course? Uh, about 21% of them say that they are putting in five hours a week. And 30% uh, of them say that they put in between four and five hours a week. So if we look at the, 
those numbers, at least half the class is putting in <coughs> somewhere between four and five hours a week, and, and some of those kids are five pluses. So there, there's an awful lot of time that we're asking kids to invest in, in this course. Uh, there are, I think, some misconceptions around uh, whether or not you had chemistry or physics in the fall, and if you did, or were there inordinate numbers of kids who were moved into the AP Biology course. So you can see that in the fall, in Intro to Chem, there were six sections of that course. By percentage, 43.75% of the students uh, were recommended for that course. There were only four sections of physics, and by percentage, 43.8% of those kids. And we didn't know this data until we started putting it together. I mean, it was just, it just sort of fell into our laps. Um, and you can see that there are 49 and 43 kids there who were uh, recommended, so that landed us just at about 92 kids who were recommended for the course. I think that there are also folks who would believe that students who are in IEPs or 504s are not able to gain access to AP courses. Um, that, obviously, uh, given this data, is not correct. Um, in 2015-16, in AP Biology, there was a student who got an IEP and a student who was on a 504. And in 16-17, there were two students who had 504s. Um, I think that the important message here is that they are never de denied participation, but what we need to see is that they also have to meet the recommended criteria. And there are students on IEPs and 504s who do. And then I think people also wonder about percentages of overrides. So we can take a look at all of the different departments. So for example, in math, they are, of all of the students at Hopkinton High School, 1.2% of the kids requested overrides in math. 1.2 in social studies, 0.9 in English, and then we can look at science. 5.4% of the students at Hopkinton High School requested in some way, shape, or form an override in a science course, not necessarily AP Biology. And half of those overrides were in fact approved this year. All right, but as a, a district, <coughs> we're thankful that people have brought these questions to us because, um, you know, we are only human and we are imperfect. And so there are some things that we would like to do for next year. Um, one of the things that we would like to do is to ensure that parents and students are very much aware of the criteria that are sort of those target numbers to gain access to AP Biology. So for example, if 87 and 92 have been our cutoff spaces, that's one of the things that I think that we would need, need to say that historically, 87 and 92 have been those cutoff places. And I mean, I think that I would say to, to kids as well, don't just shoot for 87 and 92. We probably need to shoot for something better if we want to look for um, those kinds of scores that we're seeing on test averages and midterm exams. Um, and I think that we also need to review the overall the override process as part of our school improvement plan for the 2017-2018 school year. And we want to make sure that the criteria that we are using to move kids into these classes and that the override processes are, are fair. Um, you know, it's really important for us to hear from parents and from students, you know, why they want to be in these classes and to make those kinds of compelling arguments. So we are very much aware of that. We've heard that from parents and we, we take that very seriously. So as a final summary, um, I don't necessarily know that I, I need to read all of that <coughs> for yourselves, but uh, we really do take this coursework and kids' academic readiness and um, the demands of just high school life, we take all of those things very seriously. So academically, socially, emotionally, we want our kids first and foremost to be healthy. That is, that is the most important thing. AP courses aside, um, I think that that's, that's just the most <coughs> important thing is for our kids to, to be in healthy and, and, and happy places. I mean, you only go through high school once and it should be a good experience. In addition to all of this, but again, I have to thank the high school science department, among others at the high school, and Mr. Bishop, the principal. They have put an enormous amount of research and work into this presentation. I just have the, the pleasure of delivering it. <laughs> thank you. Do, do you have anything you want to add before we go to Just thank you. Yeah. Thank you all.
just so informative when we when we came when we were here at your last meeting two weeks ago um, we talked about the importance of education um, and I know I have learned a lot um, you know through the conversations that I've had the pleasure of having with with Val with Evan with Carol um, not being a high school person myself um, and certainly not having kids in high school <laughs> anymore um, I've learned a lot I I, I wasn't surprised at, at what I learned um, but I think there's so many levels so I should say it wasn't surprised that I learned that th there is so much so many levels that and so many decisions that are taken into consideration in making these difficult decisions and I guess the only um, thing that I would add would be to the last slide as to whether or not we we want to have a conversation at all about this comparison that you threw out there around surrounding districts and and offering entry-level AP courses and not having an uh, a, a, a regular or honors level bio as a prereq um, and I don't mean to call out bio just as a general discussion are there certain certain subjects that that we want to be looking at that for I don't think your data indicates that we should be um, but I just I thought that that just came to mind as I was listening to you so so thank you for a wonderful presentation and thank you all for all of the uh, information that you brought to us tonight. I guess I, I would be remiss if I didn't thank the teachers at the high school who are teaching these courses and the introductory ones. Right. Our kids wouldn't have these courses if right. you know, the teaching. Of wasn't course. Phenomenal. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'll start. Do you want to start, Jen? No, go ahead. Go ahead. I meant I'll start on that side of the room. Not, not oh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, as you were speaking, there were a couple questions that I jotted down, and some of them you, do, you answered in the process of your presentation, but one of the things um, I was curious about that I don't know is what is considered a full course load at the high school it, for a student who, who may or may not be taking one of these AP courses? What is considered? Students take seven. Seven. Yeah, so I mean, definitely the impact of a five hour a week, a course that requires five hours of your week, that's huge. That's huge. Okay. And then, um, the other thing that I jotted down that I guess um, goes with what you were talking about as far as um, the discussion of overrides as part of the school improvement plan, um, numbers that might be interesting to look at too and might um, speak a little bit to the way that things are being done and that it seems to be doing, being done well is um, just the overall, and you may already know this, the overall GPAs of the overrides versus the folks who weren't, who, who were granted access by virtue of the of the criteria that were set up, um, and also I don't know if there's a way of measuring it, but I think sometimes qualitative data is equally impactful. But the sort of social emotional health of the kids who were over rode into the um, program versus versus not, and those two pieces might be interesting to look at too, just to see. I don't, or you you may already have it. Yeah. In terms of GPA, um, that's an interesting idea. Which traditionally, we have not. Val. One I was set. just going to say, can you guys come up here? Because that way you'll be on the recording and people at home can hear you. Sorry. To Thank you. You, you weren't staying there on purpose, so right? Is, yeah. <laughs> this is Valerie Lachansky, who is the curriculum team leader for science and the outstanding um, chemistry teacher, go, known by her kids as coach. Because she makes actually chemistry fun somehow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so just so everybody knows who, we're, who we that, invited that, today without you. Um, so I, um, I, we don't traditionally use GPA. Um, it's something to consider, and we could go back and look at that. Of course, but we're really looking for growth in okay. the student, and so I, you know, we want to look at where they are currently. So a student that maybe if we're looking at a student that's trying to override into physics or AP environmental science, but had a rough start back in ninth or tenth grade, we really right. want to look at their current year and how they're doing now and what the teacher's seeing now. Um, and not, not really. Right, right, absolutely. I was just thinking at, as far as, you know, at the end of the year, after they completed it. So yes, absolutely, in the process of, of yeah, yeah, of going, of deciding whether or not to move forward, for sure, yeah. So I, I don't have any questions. I, I mean, when we talked about this at the last meeting and, and talked about this presentation, um, I think we're all very clear about the, the role that the school committee plays here in terms of, of the decisions around placement. Um, in the AP courses, which is that we don't have one, um, and so, um, but but I do think this is great to to bring this level of attention and detail. This was extremely educational for me. Um, we talk a lot during 
uh, budget season and other times about the percentage of participation we have in the AP courses and so to see that as a comparison. Um, and I, I particularly appreciate the call outs of the social and emotional piece. Um, we, we, push, we do push our kids very hard in this district, um, and I think that is in some ways a good thing, but I, I think it's always good that we, we are applying that lens. And again, to be able to see it as compared to not just their peers within the school, but their peers in other districts, I think also helps put that in perspective. So thank you. So I want to thank you for all that data, uh, that there was a lot more coming back than what I, than what I had expected, uh, and that was certainly very helpful. And I think, as John has said, it's the individual placement is not under the purview of the school committee, but I am, I think, struck by the shift in the conversation that this is not a matter of just not enough spaces, that this is not in, in the AP biology course. I do think that it's worth, as you had alluded to, going to look at the override process in general, um, just in terms of clarity for parents' sake. And then I guess, even though this is not part of the purview, I would assume there are some choices for parents who are not, whose children are not selected into the AP classroom, bio classroom, to do either online bio, yes. or to do, as you had said, the AP in the 11th grade, or those are the two. With also the opportunity to take honors bio in 10th grade. Right, right, right. right. That's, that's and then, yes, it, and I will say as I, I've had two children go through the honors bio program, uh, it, it is also a rigorous course. It is. Yeah. It, it, and, it, and if I add to that, a lot of students that take honors biology in 10th grade will then end up taking AP environmental science as seniors where they integrate what they learned in honors biology and what they learned in chemistry and sort of apply it to some environmental issues. Mina, did you have any questions? I was not able to see the presentation clearly oh, yeah. on the screen, so I'm, I'm certainly going to review that. Um, but the message that I got um, just hearing Dr. Kavanaugh was that there's a lot of well thought out process behind why um, you know this course, course is offered to certain children, why it isn't uh, something we are able to offer to others. Um, and so I guess does that answer some of the questions that were raised in the last session? How do we explain it to our kids? Is this what we are saying? That this is this how we explain? Are we going to go back to the parents in any other forum or format and make sure that they don't have any additional questions on this? So, Dr. Kavanaugh, sorry. So I have no problem giving this presentation again to any interested parents who could not be here tonight. Uh, but Mr. Bishop and uh, Mrs. Lechchansky and I have actually had that conversation about making sure that parents and students understand what options are available, when they're available, how they're available, because we don't want students to be sort of walking away feeling like they have not been heard. Yeah. Um, so I'll just, I'll just wrap up by saying a couple of things. First, I think um, this was a tremendous amount of work and I think really great conversation to have started and I mean I think I'm not necessarily surprised by the information that you presented with us but I think the process of going through and compiling all of that is just really validating um, for the the structure of the program that we have in place in the first place <coughs> you know from my experience in sitting here for a long time and listening to changes that are made over various years as well as having now four children go through the high school and experience science at every level. Um, what I think is particularly interesting and exciting about science is that you do have so much choice that really is based on the student's skill level, readiness level, but also interest level and it doesn't I didn't understand this when my oldest child was a freshman, but I certainly do now that my youngest child is a junior, but it doesn't, <coughs> one thing doesn't have to build on another. So if they don't take whatever level as a freshman or a sophomore, it doesn't opt them out of doing what uh, something at a different level uh, that, as a junior or a senior. So I just, I like that they, I feel like in science they particularly have the opportunity to be authentic to what their interests are. And I think, um, that, that's what's most important. 
here. And that's what the kids will engage with the best. That's what they will have the most success with. And I think that um, in particular, being placed in a, in a course that you're not ready for may discourage you from shooting for that upper level class in a later year because you've had a difficult experience, whereas you may be more ready or it may be a subject that's more suited to your skills or your interests. So I like that you don't have to make a decision in the eighth grade that's gonna impact you all the way through high school. So that's a long-winded way of saying a short thing. But um, <coughs> so I, the only thing that I was thinking as you were talking, because this was so much great information that I know if I had had as a parent of an eighth grader or a ninth grader, I would have felt so much less stress about the choices that my kids were making in choosing their courses. And if there's a way, this is too long to put into the eighth grade parent night or the ninth grade parent night, but if there's a way to put a, a shortened version of this into those opportunities, just so parents have a better understanding, because you don't know your guidance counselor very well at that point, and uh, so they have an understanding that science is a little bit different than say foreign language or math, that one, and you can move within those too, but it's much easier to move around in science. And there are a lot more opportunities um, to fulfill your science requirements in the high school department than, than probably they might think. So I think if it could be included a little bit more information, no, I haven't been to those in a long time, idea. so maybe it's in there. Mm -hmm. But I feel like I was so stressed about this when my kids were that age, and I think you have such rich information to share with them that would really um, take some of the angst out of that particular mm -hmm. uh, content area that might be helpful. But in general, I just wanted to say thank you. This was a tremendous presentation, and Mrs. Al, you're, you're a rock star, the kids love you. <laughs> I know, you just, all of the teachers are tremendous. You're so dedicated, and I think one important thing that, that wasn't said that I think should be said is that you all are so dedicated, but I know that these are courses that move very, very quickly. I know on a snow day, my kids are still in school because they're online with Mrs. L doing their lessons and whatever. And so, again, if kids are struggling to keep up, there's really not time for remediation in the course. Um, the, the students and the teacher are so busy getting to um, the point that they need to be to take the test in May that, that it's really difficult um, for the students that, that need a slower pace to to accomplish that and it's hard for the teachers to accommodate that as well. So um, so I know that that's a careful consideration that you have to make when you're making these recommendations. So again, thank you very much for well, this presentation. Thank, thank you. When other districts hear what we do and they meet people that teach in other districts and they, they hear about it and how many students are taking this or that, they say, what are you doing over in Hopkinton? I said, you know, there's no one single magic thing and we do have a highly skilled, dedicated um, staff, but not just in science. I think it's K through nine and the preparation they're getting even coming into our building. We have a thriving science fair program where kids are doing authentic research, which is another way yeah. students can um, get involved in science to help sort of add to that skill set to get them ready for the, the, the rigors of the AP program, the robotics and everything that's going on in technology. Um, so there, there's a lot of things. It's all the work you, you all do, the building that we have, the one-to-one -one program. There's just so many pieces to the puzzle that all contribute to um, why we're able to, to have so many students taking AP and, and doing so well. So I can thank you all for this Thank you. All right, anybody else? I think we're good. Thank you so much. Awesome. I know you have an early morning. <laughs> okay, so now I know I can do that. Okay. <coughs> we're back to F. Is that correct? Am I keeping track? I don't know if you remember the page. I did. There wasn't anybody here. But we'll have another section at the end. Super. Um, okay, so we will move on to the school committee chair report. So I just have two brief announcements. First, um, I would like to report that on Tuesday, June 6th, the school committee attended a joint executive session with the Board of Selectmen. Um, and following the advice of town council, Ray Miaris, I'd like to report that the school committee did vote to support the Board of Selectmen's opposition to the location of the proposed gas gate station on Elm Street. Um, so, and that's a project that we will continue to follow very closely. Um, and, then my, and then in addition, I uh, 
I'm sorry to say that I have become begun in my mind to prepare for an extra interview with Mr. Dumas, who seems not willing to reset his countdown clock <laughs> for us. So um, in advance of that, Mrs. Polnick was kind enough to forward me a list of suggested exit interview questions, and I sort of called them down to a few that I thought I would throw out there. If there are any questions that you all would like for me to add to my list, I certainly can do that. So very briefly, uh, the questions that you can prepare to be asked, Mr. <laughs> Dumas, are what did you like most work about working here? What did you like least about working here? What do you feel good about accomplishing in your role as finance director for the Hopkins Public Schools? What else would you like to have accomplished? Did you feel supported in your role by the school committee? What suggestions for improvements to the district would you offer the school committee? And what suggestions for inclusion in the next iteration of the strategic plan would you have for the school committee? I'll be at Parazos next Tuesday night. <laughs> <laughs> night. I'll be there early and sure. we'll, have, we'll have our conversation. So if any of you have any additional questions that you'd like me to include, um, please let me know. Actually, you can't email them to me because that's a violation of the meeting law. So we will have to think of them right now. They could email them to Kim. Okay, you can email, email them to him. Um, okay, so that is all I have, Dr. McLeod. If you have your report, I, I, I have a very big announcement actually, and that is that there's a carnival in town, <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to make sure everyone knew. Um, there is a carnival. Very exciting. Um, this has been. I just again to 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 follow up on the recognition that we gave to Erin. This has been something that she has pretty much single-handedly taken on. Um, really wanting an opportunity for the town to gather, to celebrate, something, you know, to bring everyone together, to have fun, um, that would be memorable, um, and, and I just, I just want to thank her, uh, again, because I think you're, you're in for a wonderful weekend of, of fun. The kids are so excited, they're getting on the bus and they're seeing, you know, all of the, all of the, uh, the rides being put up, etc., uh, and and you know, nothing new is without glitches and without uh, surprises and and growing pains. And we've learned a lot through the process um, of things, you know, that that you know can can be improved um, around around permits and things like that. Um, but but that's great. And there's been a lot of collaboration with departments across town, as there always is. Um, we have a great plan in place with the police department and um, in terms of, uh, of their availability and, and uh, visibility, et cetera. So it, it's going to be a wonderful weekend. I, I'm hoping that the weather also holds out. Um, I'm not sure how it's going right now, but that is why we are here, actually. <laughs> um, uh, it just, it's the end of school. It just yeah. kind of came. It's just like that. And there's, a, there's a, so many wonderful things. Flag Day next week such a wonderful tradition and amongst other things whole school meetings um you know different just different end of school events that, that take place next week and um i was just saying to carol it's such a great week to get out and to be in in schools and to just say hello to the kids and to the teachers and um just thank them for another wonderful year uh, wish them wish them a great summer i think tonight as we went through all of these reports and and you know Jean, you, you mentioned about the about the agenda, but there's a lot that has been accomplished, mm -hmm. and that the reports to the school committee I think are so important, um, and you know that it isn't just all business. There's there's a lot of things to celebrate, a lot of information that people want to share with the school committee and that you want to know about, and uh, so I think just to celebrate that it's been a really really great year with a lot of things that have been accomplished, and um, and as you can hear as well through our reports. It's going to be a busy summer, but it but it always is, right? So um, those are really the things that I wanted to I wanted to touch on. Okay. okay. Um, so liaison reports. I don't know if anybody has any reports. Nothing like to report. Do we have an update from the athletic field? We had a meeting. We did have um, a meeting. We, I mean, so we we've, we've met with uh, we met this week with um, a meeting led by Gale Associates, the engineering firm that we have. Um, engage with we uh, I, don't, I don't think a lot of decisions there's going to be much more discussion at our next meeting but we are starting to zero in on recommendations around the programming for the field which is to say what what sports and field designs are going to be available on it as well as I think in our next meeting we're going to start talking about the different sort of 
uh, accessories, right. <laughs> if you will, that, that are required for the field to go with some of those things, whether it be safety netting or, or other equipment. So um, yeah, I think it's just the project continues to move along and gather pace and I'm looking forward to the next school committee meeting where we're gonna have a lot more information for the school committee to digest. Will we be getting a like an official mm -hmm. uh, recommendation? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So much more will be coming next week. Yep. Did you have anything, Nancy? No. Any any liaison reports from India? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> wondering if I can uh, you know start having some kind of a conversation with them should I be including someone from Dr. McLeod's team in any kind of email Senior exchanges center. or whatever we try to set up I mean it's still very early just trying to understand yeah um, any 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 way I can help any anything that that I can support the conversation I'm, I'm very happy to do that great okay great thank you that's all Okay. Otherwise, it's all fun. Lots of mangoes. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I see this. It's light there, which I'm I a little know. jealous of. It's getting lighter too. Yeah. I think it's it, really it, early yeah. in the morning, and we have not heard the cows yet. That you promised. <laughs> I've been muting. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so on to new business. First up is our overnight travel field trip request. Um, thank you, yes. So this is uh, at least the fourth or fifth year. This is a, a, a trip that the girls' varsity field hockey team likes to take. Um, it really does not involve missing any school. They are traveling on September the 8th, which is a Friday, I want to say, um, staying overnight and then returning the next day. Um, the, they are staying in a hotel. I know that we've had discussion in the past about accommodations and just permissions and, and it's volunteer parents who are doing the driving. Um, and I, I am recommending approval of this, this trip. It's a, just a great opportunity for the girls to have some time together. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? No. no. Bina, no. any questions? Okay. No, I'm not becoming notorious for my questions. No, <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> Um, okay, then in that case, I am looking for a motion to approve the overnight travel request for the girls' varsity field hockey team to travel to Dennis Yarmouth High School on September 8th, 2017, returning on December, September 9th. Not December. <laughs> so December moved. 9th. A lot of field hockey. So moved. Okay, okay and a second? Second. Okay, so that's a motion by Mrs. Cavanaugh, a second by Mr. Graziano. Jen? Yes. John? Yes. Nancy? Yes. I'm a yes. Mina? Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. So that is unanimous. Um, next is reward of contracts, the high school one-to-one -one laptops is, as well as other Apple products. And I, my preliminary question on this is, do we need one motion or is this really two different contracts? Do we have two, uh, it, two different contracts? It's two different contracts. Okay, so we'll do two votes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it should say award, not reward. Oh, so, yes. Yeah, award. Thank you. So the first one is for uh, the one-to-one -one laptop initiative. Uh, just a little background, this will be the sixth year uh, of the one-to-one -one laptop initiative at the high school. And the way that this works is that um, we act as the, um, the go-between the parents and Apple. Uh, we put it out to public bid, um, but ultimately it's the parents who are making the payments. They make the payments to us, and we in turn make the payments uh, to Apple, because Apple's not going to want to set up a, a lease agreement with, in this case, 280 families. So, um, you know, so uh, Mr. Ghosh and his his folks put together the uh, the bid specifications as to what the machines are uh, that we're going to uh, that we're going to offer, and uh, then we put it out to bid with uh, it being broken down over a three-year period into four payments under, for the new people, uh, state bid laws uh, don't allow you to award a contract beyond three years uh, without first getting uh, prior approval from town meeting. So this really isn't that kind of a case, but I just wanted to throw it out there. 
uh, if you're wondering why we do it this way. So what this is, is it's a 36 month lease um, and they, they do make four payments. So um, people have asked uh, in the past, uh, how come you only get one bid? Well, pretty typically, Apple gives us educational discounts that they're not going to give to uh, other companies who in turn would sell to us. So uh, we did put it out to bid and there were two different, uh, two variations of, of equipment that were, uh, that were bidding. And parents have indicated to Mr. Ghosh and the technology people um, which ones they're, they were strongly considering. So we estimated 140 of one unit, 140 uh, of the other unit. And so uh, at this point, uh, Apple came back with a unit cost of 1389 for the MacBook Pros and 447 bucks for the MacBook Airs to be paid for via a three-year lease. I can't tell you what the lease payments will be on an annual basis because we don't know uh, finally how many of each uh, are going to be approved, uh, are going to be purchased. So um, Apple will require that, uh, the, the, that we submit to them documentation that the school committee authorized uh, this lease and the second lease for that matter. Uh, that's just standard operating procedure. Uh, so um, the recommendation, uh, the administration recommends that the school committee approve the bid received from Apple um, at the unit cost of 1389 and 447 and funding will come from payments made into the one-to-one -one laptop initiative revolving account by students and their families. I'm happy to answer any questions anybody might have. So I, I did for a couple questions I, and I did get from Mr. Ghosh some answers to the ones I had asked initially but I'm looking not just at this year but down the road if we is it possible to look at ways to either a help families who are struggling a little bit um, with some of these costs but also the fact that uh, feedback I have heard from the community is that this comes the due at about the same time as the bus pass and just it's a hardship for some families to make that is, is there a way that we could look to work at how when and how we're charging mm -hmm. our fees that Mr. Be. Ghosh is here yeah too. I mean I can yeah. I can talk about the timing um, it would it would um, not be helpful to delay the bus pass payment uh, because we need to know now who's riding next year uh, to be able to do the routing uh, because when you have uh, every two years students moving from one school to the next you don't have that consistency so with all those transitions you really do need a lot more time so I would throw it back across to my colleague to ask him whether the payment could be earlier for, for the laptops you know, and we could bid it earlier one thing we're trying to, to look at I think based on some conversations that I've had with Dr. McLeod and our, our local group was is there some flexibility in when parents make their Payments. And so we had thrown around the possible date of November 1st, <coughs> being the time frame where we could start collecting laptop payments, but hopefully would you know relieve some stress for parents of the spring um, crunch, if you will. Uh, so uh, if that's something we can vote on, or if it's something that, that you're comfortable with, and, and central office is comfortable with, I'm happy to move forward and kind of communicate that to parents. Yeah, if I could just throw this out at you though. Um, through you. Um, you know that the, the pricing of technology can change very, very quickly. I, I just don't know that you would have Apple or whomever committing to a price in November, but you're not going to, um, I don't know when you're going to order the machines or accept payment of the machines, whether it's going to be months later, uh, whether it would be while the student was in the eighth grade. It's just some logistics that you have to work out. And obviously November is before Christmas and the holidays and so. So is that something that we could consider and adjust the timing for now? Because people have already paid for this upcoming Correct. year. Yeah. So, right? what, so. I, what I would recommend is we've collected the first round already for, uh, for incoming ninth grade parents. Uh, in the final um, lease payment document that we'll mail to them, our, our hope is communicating that the November timeframe would be the uh, 
expect a time where they could start making payments. Mm -hmm. In essence, we will probably end up collecting those payments throughout the rest of the of the year, which gives them a longer window to make those payments. Well, right, or and, break them up even to right. make a partial payment in November and March or whatever. I and we're we're comfortable doing that on a one 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 on basis. Yep. If parents are needing that, we're we're happy to work with parents. We just we want to in a way avoid every single parent making partial payments because it is a it is a heavy load on yep. our team to collect okay. those payments sure. and to follow up on those payments when parents don't make them. So we definitely give that option to individual parents that request it that are in financial need, and we work out a payment plan for them over a couple months. Um, but that, in essence, would give them kind of from November uh, to the May timeframe to kind of make that payment. Uh, and then usually our leases come due to Apple in August. So we have to have the money, obviously, before then, and we make the payments uh, to Apple. So we're definitely willing to work on that. Mm -hmm. uh, to answer your question, Ralph, a little bit, is we could always put out an initial deposit. So let's say the next year, uh, if we want to try to collect the funds in, in November for the uh, eighth grade parents, we could kind of put out an estimated deposit amount. X number of dollars, mm -hmm. and that would say if you're interested in leasing, you put right. this deposit down. We have that window to collect it. Once we get final mm -hmm. final pricing from Apple, we know the amount. We can then say here's your final cost before we order. Are you still on board? And then move forward. Yeah. So that's uh, something that we could work with. Um, in terms of your first question about making it uh, more available or kind of having some sort of financial support for parents, I think. I just want to reiterate that there are three three options to participate in the program. So if, if parents aren't financially willing or able to kind of purchase a laptop through the school district, they are allowed to uh, loan a laptop from the school. So, uh, and that device is a similar device as a MacBook Air that they can take with them like it's there throughout the course of the year. Can they take it home then they, if the, for homework and correct. stuff? And okay, that I didn't sign, realize. You sign okay. out one laptop to them, it's theirs for the year. Okay. And they're responsible for it. We, we do take it back in the summer to yeah. do some do maintenance on it, but it's, it's, it's treated like it's theirs. Mm -hmm. And so we have a loaner pool of around 30 or 40 devices that okay. we make available to those students. Uh, then on top of that, we do have you know the DYOD option. So parents that don't uh, prefer an Apple device, they can bring their own device if they're choosing um, to school <laughs> and help them be connected to the network. And, and the big question is whether or not they need special software. Am I going to be at a disadvantage if I choose a, a BYOD device? And that's just not the case. Yeah. Uh, we've kind of at a point six years in that most of the curriculum is web based. Yeah. Uh, if there's a particular course that requires software, the district actually buys software that can be put on those BYOD computers, and so we install it for them. Uh, so I think there are a number of options available to parents. I would argue at least encourage the committee to not go to considering offering another option okay. to parents because of the amount of work involved in setting that up. And I think the pricing would probably be diluted because there probably wouldn't be enough parents to get volume purchasing. Let's say we wanted a parent to, to purchase a PC. Uh, I don't think we'd have enough parents willing and able to do that to get enough discount to make it work compared to the amount of labor that we have to do to run the program. So I think we've thought about it and uh, we would consider if that's a recommendation, uh, <coughs> maybe, but at this point we don't feel that it's, it's worth the labor at this point. So now that we've graduated two classes that have, had, that have gone all four years with the laptops, there, there are laptops around, right? I, I have one <laughs> that I bought for a dollar plus tax at last year. Are they, um, do they change enough from four years ago to now? Or, you know, can people who are buying them, or keeping them for a dollar, can those be ha handed down, obviously to siblings, but to people in the community? I mean, if, we wanted to facilitate that kind of a swap or if some community group wanted to take that on as a fundraiser or whatever, would it be functional? I mean... Absolutely. The device is good. And obviously it depends on how well they care for it. But I think as far as the core device, uh, oh, after four years, it's definitely very viable. And, and most parents are not, you know, giving the, the device back to right. the school. They're buying it. And a lot of kids are just taking it to college or they are getting it down to younger siblings. We've seen several ninth graders come in with, with a laptop from uh, an older sibling. Uh, so they are viable and, and definitely, you know, six plus years you could expect or longer depending on how the device is cared for. Uh, okay. What you'll find is over time beyond that six years is that 
as the operating system changes and, and some of the software gets heavier, that you do need more RAM to kind of run the machine. And so you'll start to find that it's, it's too slow over time and that you might need to upgrade. But other than that, maybe a battery here and there, and the devices should last uh, a while. Okay. Thank you. Does anybody else have questions? Nina, any questions? Um, I have a question on the second item. What is a USB super drive? What does it do? Uh, the USB super drives are basically, <coughs> as uh, you may know or not know, the, um, the newer um, MacBook models um, are obviously going away with drives, uh, DVD drives or CD drives built into the machines. So most newer machines coming out no longer have that DVD drive uh, in the computer. And so some teachers that are still leveraging older curriculum items or CDs or DVDs or movies for class, uh, to support their curriculum, need that USB drive to play that disc because it's not built into the computer. So we, we buy a pool of them to make them available, and over time those will, will, will disappear just like the floppy disk did in the past. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a change, in, it's a change in, in computer culture, and over time those will go away. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? So nope. I think. First, I need a motion to uh, award the contract for the lease of Apple equipment to Apple Computer for the one-to-one -one laptop program based on unit prices of $1,389 for MacBook Pro and $447 for MacBook Air to be paid for by a three-year lease. So moved. Okay, and I need a second. A second. Okay, so that was a motion by Mr. Graziano and second by Ms. Devlin. Nina? I approve. Uh, and I'm a yes. Nancy? Yes. John? Yes. And Jennifer? Yep. Okay, so that is unanimous. And then do we have more update? Uh, I mean, more conversation about the next? Yep, it's least? Okay. very simple. Okay. Uh, the budget, the FY18 budget, includes funding to initiate a new three year lease for high school teacher laptops and other equipment to be used throughout the district. Um, Apple has uh, given us a proposal uh, for an annual lease cost of $89,438.90 for three years with a $196 buyout at the end of the term. All funding will come from the school department's technology budget. Okay, any questions? No, Nina, any questions? No. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure I'm going to have this motion right, so you have to listen. Um, I'm looking for a motion to award a contract for other Apple equipment in the amount of $89,438.90 per year for three years. So moved. Okay. Motion by Mr. Graziano and a second. Second. By Ms. Devlin. Mina? Approved. I'm a yes. Nancy? Yes. John? Yes. Jasper? Yes. Okay. So all yes. So that's unanimous <coughs> as well. So thank you very much. Um, and now we are on to budget transfers. Mr. <laughs> okay. There are four budget transfers. It's uh, um, up to the committee whether you want to vote them individually or in total. Uh, we can go through them one at a time. Um, this format was something that was developed maybe four years ago um, in terms of the for the new folks. What it shows is what the original budget was, whether there were any transfers done previously this year, uh, and the sum of those two columns equals the adjusted budget. Then we tell you what we're currently committed to, and that means what we've expensed plus what we have for open purchase orders. Then the net is what's currently in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, in the account. The requested budget transfer is either um, a negative, which is taking money out of that account, or a positive, which is adding money to the account. So in this case here of the elementary um, curriculum accounts, we're effectively transferring $10,533 the elementary curriculum textbooks and secondary curriculum textbooks, and that money's coming out of all of those other accounts. So the net is zero to the budget. So it's just reshuffling the deck within the curriculum accounts. 
So um, the request made by Dr. Cavanaugh is to transfer all remaining curriculum funds into those textbooks accounts so that she can make a, a purchase of textbooks. Do you want to have, at least we'll ask questions one by one, and then sure. we can probably blow them all together. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Nina? Any questions on? Um, I think my <coughs> question was specifically on the sped transportation. Yeah. Okay. Why do I see a line item under Dr. Zaliski as well as uh, Mr. Rogers? Okay, we'll get to that. Yeah, yeah okay, okay, so we're not on that one yet. Yeah. So the second one is the athletic contracted services account needs some money to pay uh, for some outstanding obligations, <laughs> all related really to the, the need to use the Fruit Street fields uh, both last fall and this spring, totally unplanned for. And it just so happens that the high school distance learning account has some extra funding in it because uh, we didn't fill all the uh, virtual high school Mm -hmm. slots that uh, that we had budgeted for. So that is transferring money from high school distance learning to the athletic contracted services account. Okay. Any questions on that one? Nina, uh, any questions on the athletic one? No. Okay. Okay. So the next one, um, within transportation, there are three different types of transportation. There's regular big uh, big yellow bus transportation, which is not part of this uh, transfer, but I just bring that up for background. There's special education transportation, which transports, uh, most of the money in that account is uh, paid to accept for the vans. And uh, there's homeless transportation. That's if a student uh, who may live in Hopkinton becomes homeless and is placed in a shelter in Shrewsbury and they have the choice to continue their education here in Hopkinton, uh, we have to pay uh, some of the costs, usually 50% of the cost, to transport that student back to Hopkinton and that would be shared with, in this case, Shrewsbury. So that account uh, needs some money. Within uh, the overall budget, um, the one area that we have uh, the most positive variance this year to tap into is the special education transportation account. And uh, Mina, if you remember when I sent you the response in the email, the reason that we had uh, the uh, extra money in the SPED transportation account is because at the end of last year, the school committee authorized the prepayment of this school year's entire except transportation mm -hmm. assessment mm -hmm. So we had surplus in that account. Right, that's where the SPED piece comes in. Mm -hmm. Okay, and for that same reason, we have money to be able to transfer into the buildings and grounds accounts that need it. Mm. Okay, there, were, there are no other buildings and grounds accounts with positive variances for me to shift money from. Mm -hmm. And it was simply uh, a matter of uh, you know, simplicity to move it out of the, out of the SPED transportation account. So uh, in the grounds, uh, in the uh, uh, buildings and grounds area, we're talking about a contract for irrigation and for field services to get the fields uh, back up the way that we needed them to be. Um, in the uh, extraordinary maintenance at the middle school, that was related to um, a uh, water heater um, and Buildings and grounds contracted services is simply ongoing um, maintenance work that ne needed to be done or will be done between now and the end of the school year. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. That, that's very helpful, Mr. Jonas. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Yep. Okay, so are we comfortable voting them all together, this one mm -hmm. item? Yep. Okay, so in that case, I will look for a motion to approve the budget transfers as presented in the agenda materials. Second? Second. Okay, yeah. so that's a motion by Mr. Graziano and a second by Ms. Devlin. Um, Mina? Yes, I approve. Okay, and I'm a yes. Nancy? Yes. John? Yes. And Jennifer. Yes. Okay, so. That is unanimous, and 
we are on to end of year balances. No, Jim, it's the end of the year already. <laughs> <laughs> so, Who's uh, you keep it track yeah. of that all <laughs> You know what? You know? Does it feel like the end of the year? You yeah, have not once. You haven't worn your T-shirt. You haven't said anything about getting your bus passes in. I know, huh? <laughs> well, bus I, I still have one more meeting. Okay. okay. Usually you start so that in like March. March. No, 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 no. So, um, request to expend year-end balances. Um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, probably a month ago, I guess I, I presented the third quarter financial report, which showed that we had a. Uh, projected two hundred and seventy-four thousand uh, dollar positive balance at the end of the year. So what that means is, with all the pluses and minuses, everything's just going to drop down to the bottom line. And you know, it could be more, could be less. I just don't know right now. Um, I haven't even received all of my May electricity bills yet. Uh, we still have a couple of weeks worth of payroll um, that needs to, you know, be earned and paid. Uh, substitute. Um, teachers this time of year, it's sort of difficult to really put a, uh, a projection on it. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, still a lot of activity to occur, even though the school year is over, uh, the fiscal year is over three weeks from tomorrow. Um, so um, at this point, um, next year, the budget is very, very tight. And I, I say this every year, and it is, it's tight at the uh, every year. Uh, but just to highlight a couple of things, um, just like in the past, we have uh, unknown tuition and transportation costs for special ed students who were outplaced after the FY18 budget was put together or whose placements for next year are still not finalized. Um, and so we won't know what that's going to be until sometime after, you know, year end. Um, we also um, have historically needed to add special education staff um, once all the students come to school in the fall. And unlike past years where we knew we had uh, a fairly healthy buffer in the circuit breaker account, we're not projecting that. Um, we're projecting like having like 50,000 bucks in that account at the end of next year if we don't have to tap into it for anything unexpected. And then there's always Norfolk County Aggie. Uh, no, we have to pay uh, the tuition and transportation costs for Hawking and students who opt to go to Norfolk Aggie. Well, the good news is the two kids graduated this year. And the other good news is that we projected that there would be two ninth graders next year. And that is, in fact, true. Uh, however, there are two current eighth graders who are waitlisted at Norfolk Aggie. And if they get accepted, it's going to cost us $27,500 for each of them. So we won't know that. Uh, so honestly, that would be on budget next year. So at this point, uh, unlike in the past, we'll have said, well, let's, let's prepay some tuition. Last year, uh, Dr. McLeod, I think, pointed out to me, and she was right. She must have heard it someplace, that we could prepay the accept transportation because we're that's a collaborative and so um, that's what we did last year we prepaid the whole thing so at this point our assessment next year is five hundred and forty five thousand dollars we're not going to have five hundred and forty five thousand dollars left at the end of the year we'll have something probably between 274 and I don't know what the number is but it will be less than five hundred and forty five thousand dollars so what I'm asking you to authorize is uh, that we, whatever is left, that we uh, pay that money to accept for uh, next year's transportation costs uh, to free up funds in next year's budget to cover unexpected stuff. It's a long way of getting around to it, but I hope you'll approve that. Okay. Does anybody have questions about this? I just think it's interesting that Mr. Dumas keeps I know. flattery at Dr. McLeod when he's on his way out the door. I, I mean, it's, I he's know. never just, viewing you this I know. year. I just, I don't know. <laughs> I heard she's running a potty for me. Uh, okay. <laughs> That's the thing you have. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Other than that, though, I have no comments or questions. Okay. Nancy, do you have any questions? No. Mina, did you have any questions? No. Okay. 
Um, I don't have any questions, but I will say I, I went through an exercise for myself of going back to 2009 and yeah. looking wow. at end of year, because I happen to have all of those packets in my dining room. Um, and looking at the amount of end of year balances, and I would like to say, while you're still here, to say it to you, since you have arrived, our end of year balances have been much lower yep. than they were prior to your arrival. And I think that you deserve a lot of credit for that. I don't know, it, it's not that you're a better guesser. I think you've done a really good job yep. of, um, you know, we've been building budgets from the bottom up. And I mean, there've been a lot of changes that have been implemented during your time here that have really, um, you know, we've gotten a lot of questions in the past about end of year balances, and I just would like to make sure that we take the time to say to you that you've done a great job with that. They're much lower than they used to be. We put them to very good purpose. That puts us in a really good financial position um, for things that are, that we have absolutely no way to predict right now, especially in the realm of special education. And so I didn't want you to Thank leave you. without that having been said. A, lo a lot of it is luck, too. We, you just don't Wait. know. Who's don't. gonna come and go during the summer? Don't push my button. Yeah, so. <laughs> but thank you. You did some kind of magic, so Flattery, thank you very humility. much. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it's a <Okay>. full moon. <laughs> so then I am looking for a motion to no authorize the expenditures of year end balances to prepay FY eighteen except collaborative special education transportation. So moved. Okay, and a second? Second. So that's a motion by Ms. Cavanaugh and a second by Mr. Graziano. Nina? Yes. And I'm a yes, Nancy? Yes. John? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Okay, so that is unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, Capital Project School Department warrant article. Okay, so let's get this out of the way. This is the least favorite thing that I do. Mm. Oh, oh, okay, we crossed so, one question off the list okay. already. Okay. There you go. <laughs> because it serves no purpose, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. So uh, there's, the, there's a capital project warrant, number 77, uh, 17077. Uh, it's for a total of $1,840.73, and it consists of three invoices, two from BCM controls uh, that's related to the system-wide security upgrades project uh, appropriated uh, in May of 2016. And there's an invoice from Greenwood Industries related to the Hopkins High School roof repair project uh, that was appropriated in May of 2015, annual town meeting. And we recommend that they be approved for payment. Okay, any questions? Nina, did you have any questions? No. Okay, um, so then I am looking for a motion to approve the payment of warrant 17-077 in the amount of $1,840.73 to the vendors as outlined in the agenda materials. So moved. And a second? Second. Okay, so that's a motion by Mr. Graziano and a second by Ms. Devlin. Um, Nina? Yes. And I'm a yes, Nancy? Yes. John? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Okay, so that is unanimous, thank you. Um, and Dr. McLeod, the, new, the Lou and Kathy White Memorial Scholarship. Yes, the Lou and Kathy White Memorial Scholarship is an annual scholarship that requires approval by the school committee. It's on the agenda tonight for, um, for your authorization. Okay, does anybody have any questions about this? I, I had a general question. Um, do we have a place on the school website where uh, we could see the list of scholarships that are offered to children? and if at all any record of who all it has been awarded to in the past years, just uh, to better understand. I, I know the list is on the guidance website um, and they send out emails to all of the seniors encouraging them to apply. They have a list on Naviance and also on their website. And the list of winners is, uh, is um, recorded at the recognitions night that we have prior to graduation every year. So if, if there's not another list, then you could just look at those programs, right? Yes. Or they're in the graduation program every year. Are, yeah. Mina, are you thinking yes. just this scholarship for all scholarships in general? All scholarships in general. Yeah, yeah. So that would answer Because this year we gave out $196,000 right. scholarship. Right. It, it was this, a lot. It's just this particular one that needs uh, on an annual basis. Has to have a vote from us, vote. right? Yeah, the way it was set up. Yeah, it was set up. Be Does that answer your question? Yeah. 
Does that, yeah, does that I guess, uh, I guess I, I have to look at that site that Jean mentioned. Okay, okay. Uh, the guidance site or anything that, that should take care of it. Okay. okay. So then I'm looking for a motion to authorize the payment of the Lou and Kathy White Memorial Scholarship in the amount of five hundred dollars. So moved. Okay, and a second? Second. So that's a motion by Ms. Devil and a second by Mr. Graziano. Mina? Yes. And I'm a yes, Nancy? Yes. John? Yes. And Jennifer. Yes. Okay, so that is also unanimous. And we're picking up steam here. Um, <laughs> Now, I believe we're ready for our second, yes? Our public comment. Are you gonna comment. make a public comment? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I know at the last meeting there was a conversation about a July school committee meeting. There's a bit of a problem. There was a miscommunication about the timing on that. The town's closes the books on July 15th. The school committee meeting needs to take place. Before at, that? In that second week of July. But. The only, the only reason that you would need a meeting, and I don't even know if you need a meeting uh, for that, is two things. One is that there will be an expense transfer to cover the outstanding school lunch debt. That's a required um, vote, but you, you don't have to vote it before I do it if you authorize me to do it. <laughs> and the other reason would, is that we would just need three signatures for the final warrant. Okay. So, so do we need to have a meeting for that, or do we need three people to come in? When would you have that ready? It, it, it probably wouldn't be ready until, like, the Tuesday or Wednesday. The, so the, the 12th, 12th. The 12th. Yeah. Well, so we just need three people could do just that one thing? Yeah, and then you could vote it formally at a yeah. future meeting. So does it work if on our next agenda we vote to authorize you about the lunch, to do the lunch? Yeah, because yeah. I'll know how much that is. Okay, so we'll put that yeah. on the agenda for the 22nd, mm -hmm. yeah. and then we'll need three people to come in and sign the final right. warrant the week of, I know Mina will not be in town. Mm -hmm. I will not be in town the I week will. of that week. Are the three of you in town that week? I'm in town. Well, I am in town. Yeah, okay. I was gonna say, you, you, you was signing you know, electronically, right? Oh, we right. can do it electronically. Yeah. Okay, exactly. Right, okay. That's what we do during yeah. the summertime. Okay. Yeah. I also have no access to the internet, but okay. I love it. Well, that does sound lovely. Carrier pigeon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's so frustrating. Glass bottle. But uh, okay, so it sounds like we can cover both okay, of those things. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so then, moving on to items by consensus. Does anybody? Is there anything on this list that anybody wants to pull out to consider separately? Okay. So then, Dr. McLeod. Uh, the superintendent recommends the school committee vote move to approve the items by consensus as outlined below. Okay, I need a motion. So moved. And a second. Second. Okay, a motion by Mr. Graziano and a second by Ms. Cavanaugh. Mina? Yes. I'm a yes, Nancy? Yes. John? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Okay, so that is uh, unanimous as well. So that means that we are ready to adjourn at 9.53, only three minutes late. That's not bad. <laughs> okay, so I just need a motion to adjourn. So, so do you want to oh, oh, ask about the next meeting I was gonna, here? Oh, yes, well, I was gonna announce the next meetings after that, but oh, I'll after. do it now. That's okay, okay I'll do so it now. Sorry. So I, I, Dr. McLeod informed me when we came in, we're gonna need to move our June 22nd meeting also to HCAM. Yes. Um, because the custodial staff will already be on summer hours at that point. So our next meeting, assuming that HCAM is listening. Yeah, I'm quite sure memorable. that Megan has already checked that out. Okay, so our next meeting will be here uh, at 7 o'clock on Thursday, June 22nd, and our summer meetings will be Tuesday, July 18th, and Thursday, August 17th, both in the central office conference room. So those are public meetings, but they will not be televised. Thank you. Okay, so now we need a second. Second. And I'll, um, <laughs> sorry, Nina? Yes. I'm a yes. Nancy? Yes. John? Yes. And Jennifer? Yes. Okay, so that was a motion by Mr. Graziano and a second by Ms. Devlin. Okay, so that is, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Good night.